Good evening, everyone. I would like to call the March 2nd, 2023 uh, Croton Harmon Board of Education meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Before we move on to approve the agenda tonight, I would like to take a moment of silence uh, in memoriam of two uh, Croton Herman, uh, two Croton Herman family uh, members who have recently passed away. Vera Lee Sack uh, served on the Croton Harmon Board of Education from 1978 to 1986, and she was also an active PTA member. And Gary Dykeman was a 10 year member of our transportation okay. department. Please take a moment of silence. For Thank you. Recommended action of the Board of Education to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. Second. Um, on the question? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for those of you joining us in person and those turning into our live stream or recording. Um, we have a couple of items. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I hope that all of our families had a wonderful winter break with time to rest and recharge. Um, I know that many of you have been following along with our budget presentations, and we will be continuing those tonight uh, with a presentation of the co-curricular athletics, pupil personnel services, and technology budgets. Uh, should you have any questions regarding the budget presentations, you can always reach out to the board and you can also email budget.questions at chuckstate.org. Uh, as you know, our, the community will vote on the budget on Tuesday, May 16th. That is also the day that we vote for board trustees. This year, there are three trustee seats at large. If you are interested in running for the board, the candidate packet, along, including the petition, is available online or at the <laughs> district office and must be submitted to the district clerk, Tracy Borges, on or before 5 p.m. on Monday, April 17th. This year, you must have at least 38 valid signatures on a petition. We hosted an information session ahead of tonight's meeting, and we will host another one ahead of the work session on March 23rd. You can find information about board service on our website. Um, I would also like to share with the community that it is my intention to seek re-election and I would also like to provide my colleagues, Mary Obermeyer and Neil Haber, a moment to speak. All right. Sure. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Um, I will not be seeking another term as a Carmen board of trust board trustee, but I want to thank the community for giving me the opportunity to serve, as well as a special thanks to all those who supported and encouraged me over the past two years. I also wanted to thank the administration. From what I've observed firsthand, running a school seems very similar to running a small town. And it has been incredible to see the vast array of responsibilities and challenges that you and the teachers and staff that you lead encounter and overcome on a daily basis. Finally, thanks to my fellow board colleagues. Through the many hours we've spent together, I've learned something from each of your unique perspectives and your gifts. I wanna close with an invitation to anyone who finds themselves thinking about whether they should run for the Board of Education now or in the years to come. My invitation to you is yes, you absolutely should. During my time on the board, I brought a different perspective. And I hope that as a town and as a board, we continue to encourage and support different points of view in our approach to educating all of our children. Being on the board has been an honor and an incredible experience. I hope anyone who's willing to take that first step this spring gets to experience the same. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I will be very brief. I will be um, running for re-election to the board in the 2023 election. I have not prepared anything else to say other than I look forward to meeting everyone in the community and being able to discuss those matters that concern community members. And I'm sure we will see each other over the coming months. Before I jump back into the rest of my report, Mary, I would like to thank you for your service. We'll have 
and many more <laughs> opportunities uh, in yeah. the coming months before the end of your uh, your term. But thank you very much for your service. Thank you. Um, so I would also like to highlight that this month, PDC will be performing the musical Susicle on March 24th and March 25th here at the high school auditorium. Uh, so please keep an eye out for information regarding tickets. I'm sure it will be a great show. Uh, I know that Superintendent Walker and our student member Molly Levitt will be discussing recent Tiger happenings and achievements during their reports. But I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to offer our congratulations to the recently announced Class of 2023 valedictorian Madeline Bogliosi and salutatorian Hannah Reynas. Well done, Maddie and Hannah. You should both be incredibly proud of your achievements. And lastly, at our February meeting, we discussed the issue of stop arm cameras for school buses. Croton Harmon, along with several other districts in the county and the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association, had advocated in support of Westchester County adopting legislation that would allow school districts to participate in a safety program to equip buses with this stop arm camera technology. I am very excited to share the news that County Executive George Latimer has stated that his office will work with the County Board of Legislators to advance this issue immediately. So we will certainly keep the community up to date on the progress of this initiative. <clears throat> And that concludes my president's report. Thank you. We will now begin our first hearing of the public. Uh, for anyone who would like to speak during hearing the public, we ask that you address the board uh, using the podium and state your name. And please give your email or contact information on the sign-up sheet provided. All right. <laughs> I will take that as we have no comments right now. And we will now move on to uh, the superintendent's report. Thank you, Sarah. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for, as Sarah said, all of you who are here in person tonight, all of you watching live, and all of you who will hopefully be watching this in the time to come. And I also want to echo uh, Sarah's thanks to Mary for your service on the board and to the community. Thank you. It's been a privilege. Um, I will be brief this evening because I know I have three colleagues, as well as Molly, who have robust and exciting reports. Um, but I, I would say is, from a thematic standpoint, I think what most of uh, tonight's images from my report share uh, are around the concept that we talk about as, an, as a leadership team from time to time, which is that between all of the day-to-day -day routine moments that kids have in schools, there are moments that we know when they're part of them that they will take with them the rest of their lives. And that, you know, there's an imperative for us to make sure that we recognize those, provide those as often as we can, and help students to celebrate that and to take a moment to, to be present for some of those really unique and special opportunities that our schools uh, provide. And so uh, I think there's a, a general theme among those student experiences in the next few slides, uh, beginning with uh, the trip to Quebec that members of our middle and, and high school Quebec club uh, had a chance to experience. And I want to thank uh, Sally Barnes, Allison Rhodes, and Christina Carnesino uh, for, for providing that opportunity to our students. I've heard from uh, several of them, their families, and from the teachers who said it was a very, very successful trip. Uh, and of course, the first opportunity post-COVID uh, for our kids to travel there. So I, I thank all of them who made that possible and hope that the kids made some phenomenal memories. Similarly, I want to thank Muncie uh, Baina and, and Zana Glasenberg for providing the opportunity for so many of our high school students to spend some time in Spain over the winter break as well. Uh, I think I think they also celebrated Muncie's birthday uh, when they were over there. I got a chance to speak with her uh, for a while. So again, I, I think we, we talk sometimes about the responsibility that we have day to day in terms of supervising kids and providing for the, the safe opportunities for kids. But I've personally never been part of an overseas trip with young people, but I can only imagine the amount of responsibility and, and worry, frankly, that goes in. Uh, to planning and implementing something like that. So I thank them uh, profusely on behalf of all the kids and their families for providing that opportunity for our Tigers as well. Since the last time we were together for a, a business meeting, we also celebrated National School Counseling Week. And so I just want to take a moment again to thank our outstanding school counselors and student assistance counselors who are uh, really vital aspects of the team and help not only our students, but their families and staff members uh, to navigate uh, really complicated times in our schools and in our lives. And those are uh, those eight people are essential and really talented and dedicated members of our team, uh, as well as our, our service dogs. I want to thank them as well. <laughs> so uh, congratulations and thanks uh, to them for all of their wonderful work. 
uh, three or four Saturdays ago, I had a chance to uh, spend some time at Blind Brook High School uh, watching four of our Destination Imagination teams compete. Uh, and this was my first uh, in-person DI experience. And I have to say, I <laughs> left just wowed uh, by what I saw. Uh, I saw kids collaborating, improvising, making, creating, presenting, reflecting, getting feedback, uh, responding to that feedback. Uh, I, I think that this is something that we should be focusing on providing as a core part of the instructional program for every student. You know, this is, we talk about future-driven experiences, future-driven learning. That's, that's it right there. Uh, and the pride that is not only from our system, but students across the region clearly took in their efforts that day was apparent. Uh, can't wait to see what our teams do next. Uh, they have some fascinating names uh, that you'll, you'll get a chance to take a look at. I think at some point, if you follow our DI uh, teams, and Josh, at some point, you have to explain the hats to me again. Um, <laughs> but really, just kudos uh, to them, to their coaches, their advisors, the families. It's abundantly clear how much time goes into the preparation of this. Um, and we are all incredibly proud of the students and their advisors and families. Additionally, it's been uh, one of the great privileges of, of my career over the past few weeks to get a chance to, to follow uh, our varsity girls basketball team uh, to several different locations as they made their way through the end of the regular season and into the, the sectional playoffs. And uh, that experience for them culminated with their uh, their game against Westlake on, I guess it was Monday afternoon at the County Center. Uh, apparently for the first time in 25 years, uh, that our girls varsity basketball team has had a chance, has earned the right uh, to be uh, in front of that size crowd. Uh, and it was a privilege to be there. It was a privilege to watch them work together, to play for each other. I have tremendous respect for every one of them, uh, for the effort that they put in, the pride that they put into their work, uh, for coaches Lucas and Zappa, uh, the Booster Club, for DJ. Uh, just tremendous kudos. You know, when a, a team has that kind of success, it lifts the entire community. Right? It, it buoys the entire community. And it was a, it was a real pleasure to get a chance to see that. Uh, so I, I thank all of them. And uh, one of the messages that we tried to impart to them in the days leading up to it, I know is just kind of be present for this, enjoy this moment, because that is something hopefully they'll be talking about when they're our age. <laughs> <laughs> Additionally, I want to echo uh, Sarah's Congratulations to Maddie and to Hannah. And I would just say that in addition to being phenomenal scholars, these are just two really high quality young people who are incredible ambassadors for uh, our entire community, frankly. And I just, I'm so excited for what the future holds for them, uh, for how well prepared they are for the rest of their lives. And, uh, and know that, I know that they know that they have roots here and that they have an entire community supporting them as they move forward. So Maddie and Hannah, again, congratulations. <laughs> From the entire community and I look forward to hearing their speeches at graduation. Also had a chance yesterday morning uh, to stop by the PVC Creative Writing Contest <laughs> Authors Breakfast uh, and uh, with, with Dr. Blair we had a, a really nice uh, way to start the day with some phenomenal young writers and got a chance to hear Nicole Kelly impart to them some wisdom that I thought was really uh, really important in that Putting yourself out there in a creative way in writing or otherwise is a thoughtful risk, right? And you're, you're sharing part of yourself uh, with others and that there's, there's power in that, right? There's, there's empowerment in that. Uh, and I thought that that was a really wise message to share with some really thoughtful young people. Congratulations to Greta and Margo, who were the uh, authors of the winning submissions. I will say it was extremely difficult uh, to choose between a lot of really impressive written submissions. And I want to give Mrs. Kelly kudos. This, this resulted from uh, efforts from the PVC administration to have our students participate in a different contest. I think they were told at somewhat the last minute that they couldn't enter. And so Mrs. Kelly, instead of taking no for an answer, decided she was going to create her own <laughs> PVC writing contest with the faculty. So uh, great credit and kudos to Nicole and congratulations again to all of our, our student authors. And also just uh, wanted to Make sure I took this opportunity to give a shout out to uh, our tremendous collaborators and supporters. Bless you when we talk about innovation. Uh, the Crow Norman Education Foundation chef. Um, two things that are near and dear to my heart, right? Support of the Tigers and great food um, coming together on March 16th. 
Uh, so if you want more information or tickets, you can email the chef board. You can email me and I'll pass you along to them or you can see their website at CrotonFoundation.org. That's my report. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much. I will now turn it over to Molly Levick for her report. Hi. <clears throat> Once again, I'm left with the scraps. Um, so, <laughs> but, but yeah, um, once again, I want to say congratulations to the varsity girls basketball team for how far they got. And then also congrats to Maddie and Hannah um, on behalf of the students and as your friends. Uh, yeah, also um, see the uh, at the high school, the quarter free progress reports are being released this upcoming Tuesday, March 7th. And the third quarter ends on March 31st, so keep a lookout for that. And the high school spring sports season starts March 13th, but the last day to register is Wednesday, March 8th. Um, also, the ping pong tournament, the SFC ping pong tournament, had to be rescheduled to March 15th. So, um, yeah, Wednesday, March 15th. Uh, yeah, admission is still $5, and you can definitely participate, but you can also just come for the pancakes and the waffles and the entertainment, which is what I will be doing. <laughs> Um, yeah, and also the PSAT 10 is being given at the high school on the 15th again. Uh, it's one of those times where I'm really happy to be a senior. <laughs> and also, I also want to mention that Luca, which is Latino in College Access, is giving a presentation on the 15th of uh, Pathways to College or Pasos a la Universidad. And it's all in Spanish and it's geared towards families with students in middle and high school. So if you or someone you know would benefit, um, keep an eye out for information on that. And <clears throat> Finally, I just want to bring attention to something that we talked about in our last um, student faculty congress meeting. Uh, we began to have a discussion about prejudice present in our school or in our schools and what that means not only for us, but our image as a school following recent events that have taken place in the high school that many people found offensive. Uh, yeah, the conversation we had definitely isn't over and I'll give more information on that, but just one important takeaway that I thought from the discussion was that these attitudes start at a really young age and people in Congress share that they've seen or experienced hateful things from a young age and that they even see the elementary school kids they watch in the after school programs doing things and like saying slurs. It's important to remember that Croton is far from immune from hate and in fact, um, some people say it's kind of ubiquitous. Yeah, we can't just try to fix the problem once something bad happens and it has to be an ongoing effort. So yeah, it's just something I wanted to bring to the board's attention. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you very Thanks, much. <coughs> <coughs> well, I have a question. Yeah. From the perspective of Student Faculty Congress in that discussion, was there and their observation, which I appreciate and feel really badly about, that attitudes are developed and are expressed hateful attitudes at an early age. Was there any discussion, any ideas about how as young adults members felt that we could address those issues as a system and at the earlier grades? Um, is that something that that was talked about or might be talked about in uh, yeah, that's meetings? definitely something. Sorry, that's definitely something we're going to continue talking about. Again, this was only the first part of the discussion when we got cut off, and we're going to keep talking about it in our next meeting. But one thing that we just one thing at least at once it gets to with the middle and high school, definitely um, accountability, and then kids looking out, and then kids watching each other and helping each other. You know, not say things and to not be um, <clears throat> prejudiced. So yeah, self-accountability and like self-awareness and then just also um, responsibility looking, um, setting a good example for like you and your peers and yeah. I would be interested in that discussion if there might be some reflection among your colleagues or the, the people in the at the Congress about how what we have done, how the middle school upstander initiative, the um, elementary school reach um, activities have been, in their view, effective or not effective in countering some of the things that we've talked about, and whether there are other things that they feel. Because, you know, adults talk about this all the time, all right? The board talks about it, administrators do, but we don't really hear from students that much. And I think it would be great um, to hear from you. And I will add 
since Mr. Clark and Ms. Kelly aren't here, then it might also be interesting to have that kind of discussion with the PDC um, Student Congress or mm -hmm. Student Council. Yeah, I can definitely um, ask them to include that <clears throat> um, on the agenda and we can talk about that in the next meeting. I just, one thing is that we did discuss a little bit how um, we don't, it shouldn't be sort of too detached from us as individuals when you have these these bigger programs are really important, but it's not the only thing that we should be doing is that uh, it, because then it's sort of, we don't want to remove ourselves from the solution. It has to be personal. And even if that's uncomfortable, kind of scary. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I will now turn it over to Denise Harrington Cohen to uh, begin our uh, Assistant Superintendent for Business Budget Report. Okay. Thank you, Greg. So this evening will be the fifth in our series of budget presentations. Uh, we are presenting uh, four components of our budget, critical and exciting components of our budget that will be led by our directors. I'm not good. Their, their titles are very lengthy. So <laughs> I, will, I will present uh, when, when they get to their portion of the budget. Um, and as always, the driving force behind all of our decision making with regard to budget is our, our guiding questions and our strategic goals. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Mr. John Griffiths to talk a little bit about co-curricular. Thank you on. very much. Um, co-curricular is talking about um, pursuing passions, right? So this is the way that the budget is able to really support our students really developing their interests, their talents. It um, it offers our students the uh, the chance to pursue something that they really enjoy outside of the academic day, um, stimulates creative thinking, um, goes far in improving social skills, many times organizational skills. And uh, we'll just want to take a quick a snippet at our three buildings when we Look at what's on the screen right now. CET offers a lot of its co-curriculars in the before school hours. We see that um, uh, a lot of them are uh, creative pursuits and also ways to really experience mathematics in a different light, more through gameplay and more fun activities that really uh, reinforce mathematical thinking. I really want to bring attention to the Kindness Club, the Kindness Club was um, last year a, a, a one grade stipend. And this year we've expanded it because of a great interest amongst all of our upper elementary school students. And these students, I've got to say, uh, if you look at that list of what they're doing in terms of activities and fundraisers and know that that's only a partial list, I'm actually really, really in awe of, uh, of how much one co-curricular and how much one group of, of students under the very, very enthusiastic and, and never ending energy of, of two faculty members are able to add so much to the culture within one school building. Uh, it really is phenomenal. Um, taking a, a look at uh, PBC, um, there has been an increase uh, in the number of clubs being offered. Uh, what you see uh, presented here in front of you are an offering that will be now for the 23-24 school year of 24 different clubs in our middle school. Uh, additionally, really highlight the intramural program. Uh, really continues to be impactful due to uh, students uh, taking part in organizing activities at recess under the supervision of a PE teacher. Uh, and these can include sports, sidewalk games, um, building of the Cobb bench, which you may have heard a lot about in, in the past. Um, PBC Middle School is able to, uh, most importantly, through the co-curricular um, programs, uh, offer students a way to pursue uh, their passions. Uh, we're talking about kids between 10 and 14. Uh, and you know what? At that age, students don't always know what their passions are. And the club structure at the middle school allows students to explore new areas of learning, and um, certainly in turn develop um, some critical skills. Uh, then when we get to the high school, we have nearly 41 co-curricular clubs running at the high school. 
Important to note that uh, nearly all of these clubs are student led, uh, with uh, students initiating a partnership uh, with faculty advisors. Uh, each year, we actively encourage students um, to explore their interests and passions to develop and pursue new clubs. So the philosophy uh, on the range of clubs, as well as the emphasis, uh, is in line with that idea that we value, that how are we going to develop passions? How are we going to give students voice? How are we going to give them choice? Well, one of the ways we certainly do that is by allowing them to think about what new offerings they want to have and empower them to actually uh, actualize those, those programs. Um, as uh, Mr. Walker mentioned, uh, we are able to uh, also support ongoing amazing opportunities such as our international trips, our exchange programs, like the recent trip we saw pictures of from Spain, uh, our upcoming exchange with students from La Rochelle in France. Uh, we offer financial support for our faculty members who are supporting students in developing their new clubs. Uh, for example, in the upcoming school year, this new budget uh, will be um, supporting the development of a new STEAM club as well as a new cooking club. So a lot, a lot of great things happening when the academic day concludes. And uh, really uh, going right in line with uh, what happens when the academic day concludes right alongside co-curricular opportunities are of course, um, oh, I'm sorry, before we move into athletics, we have a little bit of a presentation of our budget. <coughs> Take care of that, Denise. Sure. So this is just an overview by building. Uh, District-wide, we've gone down slightly due to the incorporation of a stipend mm -hmm. into an individual salary that was normally stipend out. Um, now we have the increase at the high school, uh, PDC, as John mentioned, and then the Kindness Club at CET shows uh, that increase of 14% added to uh, new co-curricular stipends there. So that's an overview. I had such a great segue, I feel like I gotta repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, after school day ends, it's not just co-curricular, but also athletics. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Are we doing questions now or at, uh, do you wanna- We could do, we could do, it's, we could do either one, because we, why don't, it probably makes more sense to just address it as we go along. Okay, if we could go back to the, uh, to the, but the budget slide, the the budget? Budget, that one, yeah. So we have 500 some students at CET and um, similar numbers of students at the middle school and the high school. Um, possibly a little bit more at CET than at each of the middle school and the high school. You know, that there are five grades at the, at the elementary. And yet we're only spending, um, a tiny portion of our co-curricular budget on CET. And I don't think that, I don't think that there is a lack of demand for co-curricular activity at CET, as we've seen that there is great participation in the programs that we are offering. Well, I understand that it might not be possible in this budget to increase that significantly. I would love to see in future years that we start bringing up the investment in co-curricular activities at CET to make it to provide more a more broad set of co-curriculars. And I know that the way co-curriculars have to work at an elementary school is different because they are not, you know, our co-curricular clubs at, at the middle school and at the at, at PVC and at CHHS are student truly student run. They have student, they have a student president, a student treasurer, and so on. We're not going to have K through four students serving as the treasurer of a of a club, but so we need to have a, a different methodology. But I think that's something we should take some time over the coming year to explore, see how we can do that and uh, how we can expand expand the, the opportunities that we're giving at CET. Two, uh, two comments I'd have in response to Josh. First of all, I think that'd be music to Mrs. Bianchi's ears mm -hmm. because I think she is interested in considering you know how, how offerings can be expanded. The other thing that I'll mention, it's not included um, in the co-curricular report, but as I, as I said, um, the really the time for co-curriculars is before school of CET. And we don't include um, our ensemble programs mm -hmm because really we think of that as part of our core curriculum offerings. But in CET, 
the offering of band and orchestra and chorus is actually done during the co-curricular time. So if you look at really what happens in terms of student involvement during that co-curricular time before school and take into account the numerous people that are in our on ensembles, we actually see that there's actually a robust student participation in um, activities before school that's not represented in, in these figures. I think one thing that would be, uh, uh, to, no, I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you in a moment. Um, it, it would be useful, I think, if we could see a, a breakdown that kind of goes together with this uh, to number of students participating um, might be, mm -hmm. or perhaps a student a number of student hours of participation, because I know that it gets a little complicated at PVC and CHS with students participating in right. multiple clubs. And I know we have that information because it's in the uh, in the annual report. I think it'd be interesting to see that in comparison. Right? Yeah, our, our director of technology innovation writing notes to see if there is a <laughs> way to really capture that data in our student information system as well. That'd be great. The other component is the house system, which really functions very similarly to uh, the co-curricular clubs uh, at CET. So, and that is not captured in these figures as well. It's in another area of the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I guess my first question is why does the house system qualify as co curricular? And my second question is why is the only time allotted to co curriculars at CET in the morning? So uh, the house system is not a part of co curricular. Right, but you're yeah. saying that it kind of would fall into this category. So I guess I want to know why it does or doesn't and what the distinction is it would qualify it as one or the other well so co-curricular from an accounting perspective does not exist at cet because it has to be student run and student driven it cannot be initiated the under the guidelines for co-curricular it can't be um, teacher generated it has to be student generated so it's very different at the elementary level um, we've had the morning programs uh, for the past probably like 10 years. And I just cut you off. I guess I'm confused because I don't understand how chorus and kindness club are student generated. They're not. But, but we, have, we have bundled them okay. into co-curricular. Okay. But uh, what, I, what I'm explaining is that they, we are putting them here, but they don't necessarily belong here. However, from an accounting perspective. However, the function that they serve is like where the house system is within the school day for the most part, which and it's brand new, which is why we don't have it here. So, so there's a lot of gray area. We're pulling you know, what we think is valuable and what we don't. As John mentioned, the chorus and the morning program have generally been viewed as an extension of the music program or program. Right. And then I guess to follow up on my second question, why are co-curriculars only available at CET in the morning, as John said? And I don't mean to misquote you if I did. No, no, no. Me. You yeah. never quoted. It. I mean, I, it, it's, it, it's a scheduling facet that's pre-existed. Uh, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's been going on that way. I would imagine that there was, there was a history that was developed in the rationale for it. Uh, it's certainly a question that could be asked. Yeah, it's certainly, it's a fair question. Uh, you know, why CT has chosen the morning hours, and uh, is there a, a new opportunity to look at the potential for after-school activities? That's fair enough. I, I think that's a fair question. I was thinking, as Connor was talking to you before, she began about we do have period during lunch. We do have the possibility of some kind of an organized co-curricular activity for those who are interested during that lunch period. But then I was thinking, and availing that is staffing, because mm -hmm. teachers are working pretty much, you know, except for the, the breaks when the kids are specials or whatever, they're working full time and that's their lunch period. Yeah. So we really can't bring them in. So I think what I guess we're all talking about is thinking a little more creatively as an administration to see what other opportunities might be made available at whatever times so that 
we are able to give kids at CET opportunities for co-curricular activities that may fall without outside of those that we have discussed today. Mm -hmm. I also realize that there's busing issues, transportation issues, because we don't want a late bus, <clears throat> but there are a variety of things at least to think about to see if we can provide more opportunities and experiences mm -hmm. for our elementary school kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I also think you know we're somewhat hobbled by the by the state's definition of the word co-curricular. Mm -hmm. Um and that and it, it's really def defined in a way that really targets kids that are older than elementary level. Um and that means we need to find some other, and I don't know what the right word is, some other category. That, that can fit into. And I know that we have had in the past, we had an a after school program that was run by the district, which we were told to do, and therefore it's outsourced. Someone else runs that program. Uh, but in the school building, that's that provides a lot of features for our district, especially for uh for for families that do not have um the ability to don't have anyone who's going to be at home to meet kids when they come off the bus uh and therefore <clears throat> they need that aftercare um and that's it's great that that happens and that there is an organization that's able to offer that here i'm kind of wondering whether that's something that could work together with this to whether there's things that could be offered in conjunction or I, I know that we need to do it would need to be done in a way that makes it equally accessible to all students because that is the fundamental distinction for co-curriculars, which is that a co-curricular club is allowed to charge dues to its participants because the the students vote on what their dues will be. Whereas at an elementary level, you, you couldn't really do that mm -hmm. uh, to support the operations of a club. So we need to come up with a, a different way of funding um, the club's operations beyond just the stipend that obviously we do do cover by anything like, you know, uh, mo many, many of them, I know that many of the clubs at PVC and CHHS charge their uh, assessed dues to their members. Uh, obviously, that would have to work differently. Uh, if it's not going to be student to government. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want a question for, for understanding. You said that Denise had um, CET since that line item or that amount fall out $17,000 next year right, is not strictly within the definition of co-curricular for accounting purposes. Mm -hmm. Because must be student led. If I were looking at the budget and the line item, the, the four four numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I I think I understand that that seventeen seven one nine would not appear kind of right under what you'd have for the high school and elementary and, and middle school, but would be pulled found in other sources within the elementary school budget. No, it actually is. It is under a co-curricular code in the budget, similar to the other two schools. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, it is. It, it is, is, even though it's not. Even wise. though it is um, accounting wise accounted for completely different. It's accounted for as though it were a, a scholarship grant. It's it's a completely different accounting structure behind it. Um, that is very labor intensive. Um, because we have to monitor the incoming of cash, the outgoing of cash, all of the expenses, but they're monitored slightly different than the other clubs. Because the other clubs fall under uh, the treasurer for co-curricular clubs. Right, where they, they, go through through that, mm -hmm. they go through an activities fund yeah. and they go through the mm -hmm. um, extra class extra activities. activities fund. Okay, got it. 
There you go, John. So is this something that advocacy should be talking about? About I mean, is this something that we should be asking the state to reform to make it easier to do co-curricular programs at elementary schools? Well, if I'm understanding correctly, it is not that we are hampered in providing co-curricular programs at the elementary school. It is that it is a different accounting process right. on the back end for, right. for accounting purposes. I'm, I'm just saying, is there anything that forms impediment in law mm -hmm. that makes it difficult to do this that we should be, you know, considering perhaps as something to put forth as a resolution to, with NISBA? If you get NISBA. a hold of Gatsby, yes. Yeah. 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 I would say yeah. Yeah. Law, it's <laughs> the Government Accounting Standards Bureau. I don't think that this is something that yeah i would say that would be uh you know, uh, 72 or whatever let, let, let's take it off on i'd like to i'd like to think about this just a little sure. bit okay. <laughs> question about uh the the academic intervention services that were we approved last year is that under co curricular mm -hmm. that's within the instructional budget of the, yeah. so the building. okay here we go <laughs> All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for uh, coming out tonight. I'll uh, introduce myself quickly for those of you who have not yet had the opportunity to meet me. I'm DJ Goldman. I'm the director of health, wellness, physical education, and interscholastic athletics for the Croton Harmon Union School District. And I am happy to share uh, some of the vision for the athletic program and also some of the other educational components that exist within my title. So, one of the first things that I want to discuss with everyone are some of the enhancements that we're making to the learning spaces. And when I first came on board, there was uh, some serious conversation about enhancing the branding around uh, the high school, the middle school, and other elements of the athletic program, including down at Spencer Field. So uh, to build off of some of those conversations uh, throughout the course of this year and looking into next year, we're going to continue to provide some uh, increased opportunities to exemplify our Tiger pride. So at the high school and the middle school, uh, we are going to look to add new scores tables. Uh, when I last did the assessment of the scores tables, PVC doesn't actually have one. Uh, they just use a folding table for all the volleyball and or basketball games that take place within the PVC gymnasium. So looking at utilizing a new scores table uh, for both the high school and the middle school, that is a modular system so that we can have, you know, one larger scores table for any large events that are taking place at the high school, but it also has the capacity of detaching to be able to provide one of those sections over at the middle school uh, with a digital display in front so we can have some more branding opportunities, uh, also put in some pictures and other kind of like moving elements that would really enhance the space. Lots of different, um, you know, places that we've been even including this year, including as was previously mentioned at the county center, um, are using some of these digital scores tables just to enhance the experience of anybody who's in attendance at the games. Um, also, we are adding the new scoreboards at PVC and also down at Spencer Field, which have already been installed. And then looking at the CET gym space, we are uh, in collaboration with Dr. Blair, uh, the PE uh, teachers over at CET, along with the building level administration. Uh, we're putting in 86 inch screens uh, that not only will be able to really enhance the space there, but also enhance the teaching opportunities uh, that our physical education teachers will be able to provide for the students of CET. So the next step, is how are we going to be utilizing these things uh, to enhance the program? And for the athletic program, one of the things that we are looking at adding is a boys varsity volleyball team, which has really started to take off in our area. We're seeing mm. large amounts of growth. When I first came on board here, I was approached by several young men who were participating in the boys volleyball club, uh, which I have learned has been in existence for quite a few years. And after doing an assessment of the program, identified that it is something that is sustainable here. So in seeing that other schools within our you know, section have started to launch boys volleyball varsity level programs um, and seeing that our program is at a level that could be sustainable, um, I'm hoping to be able to add a varsity boys volleyball uh, experience for the upcoming year. Similarly, as far as we talk about programming opportunities through the lens of uh, the physical education program, looking at some enhancements for the high school fitness center. So having some new, um, you know, different kinds of 
fitness exercise uh, programs are things that I'm looking to be able to implement. Over in the middle school, uh, through the uh, CHEF grant that was awarded to Kevin Brunel, and then also in additional conversations about helping to provide a golf simulator for the students of PVC, along with our uh, varsity golf teams, and also other opportunities to be able to have the, the software, the again, the, the teaching materials and those kind of things that will help to enhance the program at the middle school to include uh, some outside the box thinking when it comes to opportunities that can be available for the physical education program. That can also have some tie-ins to the, the high school varsity level programs as well. And then also over at CET, continuing to identify uh, curricular planning to implement the upgrades to the learning space. I just wanted to say if there's a point in the future where I'm um, can't be found by the board, <laughs> I'll be a PVC using the golf simulator. <laughs> <laughs> One other piece that I thought was important in reviewing the current programs that we offer at the high school and the middle school. So this is a list of all of the programs that we currently offer for the 22-23 school year. Now, all the sports that are listed, um, this is also housed within our website um, under, you know, a category of like learn more about pro and hormone athletics. Um, and these are the sport offerings. Now, with that being said, we do attempt and we do provide opportunities for all of these sports at all of these levels. However, sometimes due to student interest, we may or may not run a specific program. So for instance, even though last year through the board's help, we were able to approve a merger for girls ice hockey, we did not have any students interested, but it was still something that we offered for anyone who might be interested in the future. So again, this is a list of all the programs um, by season and by level that we have available to our students for this year. And then, like I was saying before, you know, given the, uh, the potential to add a boys volleyball program that would then build into the list for the upcoming school year. May I? I just have a Title IX question with respect to the boys varsity bond. Sure. So how does that balance out? Was that, I know we have a girls program, obviously, that we're very proud of. Um, but was that something that was in response to a boys ball? It was a program that's now like, how does that all play out? No, thank you for asking the question. So in assessing the full program, we currently offer two more programs for girls than we do for boys. So Sorry, this is two in terms of numbers of programs. Not number of programs. Not necessary number of participants and to different. Correct. Yeah, we do have, you know, varying levels of participation from year to year. But as far as the number of programs that we offer, we currently offer two more programs for girls than we do for boys. Um, so that brings us one closer. But as Neil said, you know, it is you know a deeper dive into the number of participants. Sure. Um, and like I said, like you had mentioned, you know, we do currently offer the, the girls program for volleyball um, and boys volleyball is a growing program. Another one that I had conversations going back to last year was for girls football, which you might see some recent publications about girls flag football starting to take off in our area. When I first had conversations with students about that possibility last year, one of the tie-ups is that it is a spring sport and the great number of participants that initially expressed an interest were more so on the girls lacrosse team. <laughs> and section one, one of the few sections in the state does not permit students to participate in two sports in the same season. So it has gone up to vote several times. And even though I would be in support of allowing students to participate in more than one sport in a given season with some certain rules in place, um, in order for it to be a constitutional change, we would need to have two thirds of approval and we have not been able to hit that threshold. So uh, while we do continue to see if it would be a possibility for us to add additional sports in the future, that conversation about like sustainability um, and also student interest will continue to come up. Mm -hmm. I know that Boys Varsity Volleyball Club is very active, so I'm sure there's a lot of people who are gonna be very happy about that. Yeah, it was really exciting to have conversations with several members of the team and just talking about how, you know, even currently they're going down to like downstate and they're like playing until like 11 o'clock at night or one o'clock yeah. in the morning. So <laughs> they're very excited at the opportunity. They've been great partners and, you know, having conversations and thinking about logistics and how everything will work out. So it's been really exciting to, to see, you know, in the year and a half that I've been here to continue to have those conversations and, and see that they're excited about it too. DJ. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Um, I know uh, 
this year, this past season, uh, some of the sports offerings were oversubscribed. What would the district have to do to offer additional space or just offer two sections? To that? So when it comes to having multiple teams for a given sport, um, there is always an opportunity to do it when there is specific interest. Uh, but it also goes back to the discussion about, you know, how much space do we have available? How easy is it to find coaches for those potential positions? Um, what other opportunities could we look at offering without technically having like a second modified team or a second junior varsity team uh, when there are large numbers of students who are participating? So those are conversations that are ongoing, you know, throughout, you know, the administration about, you know, what we want to try to do especially when we do see certain sports that have high numbers of participants. I know specifically, you know, the basketball programs in the winter, when you have five students on the floor and you've got a lot of people who are interested, that's usually one. And the other one that typically comes up is volleyball. Again, you've got six kids who are on the floor and lots of kids who are going out for it. So, you know, in conversations with coaches, building level administrators, district administration, you know, we really try to figure out ways that we can provide opportunities that will also allow for maximum success for the kids who are you know, members of the team, yeah. while not then impacting and saying, okay, well now your experience is going to be 50% of what it was, you know, had we gone the other way. Yeah. Is there any other sport that could be offered when you see that big subscription for basketball or volleyball Say, you know what, there's an interest in the popula you know, student population to do some kind of sport in the winter. Yeah. Pickleball. Yeah. Pickleball, yes. <laughs> so unfortunately, the New York State Public High School Athletic Association does not provide an opportunity for people. But um, to answer the question, it is something that I have looked at, like especially when we look at programs that we currently offer in the fall season, for instance, let's call it field hockey, yeah. where we have many students who are participating on the volleyball team. And if they were to have a team selection process, and then those students who are not selected, there's no guarantee that they would all go to field hockey. They might still go to cross country. They might still go to girls soccer or to girls tennis. Um, so yes and no. You know, if we always present that opportunity whenever we do a team selection, hi, I'm sorry that you you know have not been selected for the basketball team, but please remember that we have other opportunities available to you, whether it be for you know indoor track and field or wrestling uh, and those kind of things. So we do have those conversations, but it's never a guarantee, especially at the middle school level. A lot of the kids are doing things because that's where their peers are. So that's that's a big part of the conversation as well. And looking at you know the philosophy of the program itself is, you know, are we looking at the middle school transition to the junior varsity transition to the varsity team? And how do we make sure that we try to have as many students participating that are still gaining insight and skill development through the program mm -hmm. um, as they continue to get older and progress through the program? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. About the boys volleyball. And I, I have sort of seen that that's growing around the state, but it's a winter sport. It's a fall sport. It's a fall sport. It is a fall sport. Because I got an email that said section two boys volleyball playoffs. We're in section one, so perhaps so somewhere else so set, so, are playing it and, in a different season. Okay, and that's that brings up a question. So if it's a fall sport, then we have a conflict with girls volleyball in terms of space, but we don't have the same conflict it's in the winter with basketball, because that's one of the things that I'm thinking yeah, about. Yeah, it, it would be much more of a significant <clears throat> conflict if boys volleyball was in the winter mm -hmm. than having it in the fall. Ideally, it'd be a spring sport when we don't have anything going on in the gyms, uh, but the state championship is offered in the fall, so that's how Section 1 has made the decision to align it with the fall okay. season. Because I, I have an email somewhere that said, if you want to watch the Section 2 boys volleyball playoffs you can go on but that's outside of the schedule for the states for boys volleyball they might in other sections that would offer it in the winter and i'm not familiar with what other sections would also offer it in but, the winter but the state, but the state then, program is correct state, gotcha yeah okay and i, I guess yeah, my, my concern was if it was in the winter and right facility space yeah yep. now we're <laughs> I know with your predecessor, and Mary and I sat on this athletic committee uh, 
together at that point, we had conversations about intramurals. Is that considered more of a co-curricular or is that still fall under athletics? And is there a possibility for any intramural programs? So we have an ability to run an intramural program <laughs> as an extension of the athletic program, not through co-curriculars. We would have to get a little creative in who would be supervising the space when it's available. When I was here last year, the conversation around running an intramural available to those students who were not selected for one of the basketball teams, <laughs> yeah. where the coach of the you know specific gender program. So if boys basketball was practicing from 4:30 until six o'clock, and girls basketball was practicing from three o'clock till 4:30 then the boys coach would have an opportunity to run an intramural session in the third floor gym for those students who were not selected. Mm -hmm. This year, when we added the modified wrestling and modified cheer, it kind of ate up that third floor space. So the timing didn't really work out well to be able to make that same kind of um, opportunity available at that time. So we could get a little creative, for instance, if there is an away game scheduled or if there's an off day for a specific program but to have like a set in stone schedule available for intramurals the question would really come up with facility space and then who's supervising it you're welcome uh, all right so the next piece that we were talking about is continuing to build on the culture of support for our, the athletics program so one of the things that's been one of the highlights of, of my time here at Croton Harmon has been some of the special experiences and special events that we've been able to provide for our students. So thinking about our homecoming um, experiences in the fall, having events in the springtime under the lights, um, also being able to provide opportunities for kids to take part in, you know, special invitationals or, or tournaments um, and other like special competitions like we've been able to provide for the winter cheer team. Um, is something that's really a highlight to be able to hear stories from kids about, you know, the experiences of participating in these special opportunities is really the highlight uh, for me as the athletic director to talk about what can we do more to help gain more uh, student participation or more interest and excitement about the programs that they're participating in. Another thing that I've been working really hard on is trying to increase the social media presence so that people are notified about what's going on, good things that are happening, uh, really partnering with some of the students and you know helping to promote some of our games. Uh, some of our kids do a really good job of creating like Instagram flyers or Canva flyers to be able to uh, put out on social media, creating theme days to try to get out there and support their friends. Um, and it's something that you know it, it, we continue to find that kids are so involved, are, are involved in so many different things that trying to get them to our games, we have to make it almost an event unto itself. And that's something that we're continuing to work on. So trying to come up with some other opportunities to continue to show support for not only the kids who are participating, but also trying to get kids out to the games to help support their friends. Um, I want to try to continue to build on something that was done previously, which is like a student profile. So something where I've developed a survey to go out to kids. So as we get ready to launch the spring season, again, increasing social media presence. So for those students who are participating within our athletic program, you know, just a quick little blurb, you know, when did you start playing sports? Uh, what's one of your most like inspirational quotes or, you know, even some, you know, funny questions like what would be like your favorite like walk up song for, you know, a baseball at bat or uh, what's your what's the hype music you listen to before you go out and play a game. Uh, so some of those things just to continue to highlight the students who are a part of our program. One of the big things that I'm really proud of um, is the is the launch of our athletics hall of fame. Um, I've been working with, you know, a good number of people about trying to get this off the ground, including representatives from the Booster Club, um, alumni, uh, community members about trying to uh, set up a program where people can nominate um, former athletes or coaches or teams uh, to be inducted into a Hall of Fame. So I was talking to uh, Laura Duback about, you know, space within the high school halls, you know, to try and have a space to to highlight uh, an athletic Hall of Fame, try and have a ceremony, you know, either at halftime of a football game or at another point in time so that we can continue to highlight, you know, a tagline that I've kind of been working on a little bit or at least a general, you know, quick snippet of a philosophy of, you know, honoring our past to inspire our future. And trying to figure out ways where you know we have a rich tradition of the athletic program here in Croton Harmon, and if we can continue to highlight those things from our past, then it just provides opportunities for our kids to you know be inspired to try to achieve that in the future as well. 
Um, and then <laughs> lastly on there, things that have been going on for a very long time, you can see a picture of um, our, our volleyball team helping out of the Harry Chapin run and just be giving back to the community. You know, our wrestling team, you know, sells Christmas trees, our, our teams help out during the Harry Chapin run. We've got, you know, kids who are helping out all the time and continuing to showcase that our athletes aren't just athletes, but they're also in it for the bigger picture of the life lessons that they're learning as a part of the athletic program. And this is the fun part with the numbers. Um, so, you know, some of the quick highlights from the from the slide. Um, some of the increases that you'll see as far as like the coaching line, we've got the boys volleyball um, included in there, along with just the, contract, the contractual um, increase from year to year. Uh, we're also looking at then the supervision line as we continue to get away from the COVID impact on the dollar amount that's associated for supervision of our athletic events. So continuing to have a slight increase uh, as we return back to, to full athletic activities. In the contracted services, one of the things that I've built in is the assumption that we will not have access to Spencer Field because we will be starting our uh, capital facilities plan. So increased money allocated for turf rental or rental of offsite um, places just in case we do not have the ability to use uh, Spencer Field. Uh, also including, you know, additional police coverage for certain events as we continue to highlight, you know, safety and security features. Uh, that was something that I thought was important to include just in case uh, there are special events, night events that where we are currently having um, the, the Croton Police help out. Uh, BOCI services, it's a slight increase year to year. Those are just generated from uh, BOCI services fees. And then you can see in like the materials and supplies line, like I was talking about before, uh, the, the scorers table is pretty much the, the big ticket item in there. Um, and continuing to assess the, the large pieces of, um, you know, things across the district, like I was saying before about scoreboards or scorers tables or other things that are reaching end of life, we need to start to prepare for their replacement. <clears throat> so very exciting. <laughs> Got a bunch of questions. All right. First, you said scoreboard at Spencer and scoreboard at PVC. Mm -hmm. The Spencer scoreboard obviously is outside, although, you know, if there's the field's not in use, is that something that is to be done in the 23-24 budget? Or is that because the expectation is that by September 24, the construction of the field and the turf field and associated things will be done. I'm wondering about the timing of that this year. So the scoreboard down at Spencer Field has already been replaced. And the scoreboard that is there right now will be, will see its first use for the upcoming spring season. The plan is that when Spencer Field goes under construction, the, the scoreboard that has been purchased is just one of three pieces that we will then, when the scoreboard finds its final home in a certain location, um, whether it's through the bond, uh, more likely than not, we'll be able to add two more pieces to the scoreboard for it to get to its final uh, full um, you know, rendering as what it would look like. But knowing that we have had issues and malfunctions with the scoreboard down at Spencer Field, uh, we thought as a district it was important to try to replace it before we had you know, a complete failure. So we okay. did install that now, knowing that in the future, we were going to have to move it and build onto it, but just to keep it so that we were in best uh, shape for the upcoming spring season. And then at, at PVC, we're talking in the gym. In the second floor the gym. second floor gym. Yep. That produced basically the modified and... Basketball, uh, volleyball, and then also for physical education classes or any right. other. Scoreboard. The scoreboard. Right. And then my other question was in terms of the budget. Um, what I see is with a new coach added, there's about a 5% increase. And also the contractual. Right. And the rest yeah. would be contractual. And in terms of the field, if Spencer is out of commission at some point during 23, 24, what do you anticipate to be the venue for practices? I'm thinking mainly about football and perhaps you know, lacrosse or soccer and games. Yep. So for the most part, currently, 
we don't practice on Spencer Field right. because we don't want to, you know, take it all the way down. So the great majority of practices will stay in the normal practice spots, whether it be a Manus or CET upper. The great majority of games, another piece of the bond is to extend CET. So again, depending on timing, we may play some more of our games on CET and Manus for lacrosse and soccer. What I will look to do, because again, it depends on the timing of everything. Uh, so in, in for the 23-24 budget, the assumption is that we would lose Spencer Field for the spring of 24. So we would be looking at the lacrosse um, and track and field events, which we would, I would look to schedule more away games, but also to try to partner with Pace to provide a couple opportunities for our kids to be able to play games over at Pace um, if, you know, the schedule would allow. So partnering with the, um, with Pace, and then like I was saying about scheduling more away games, and then also depending on the timing, trying to get more of our games on CET Upper and also over at Manus, so at least we're keeping things on campus as much as possible. And if we go as far as fall, if we're not yep. done by September 24, yep. uh, August 24, what is your anticipation for um, football? So, so similarly, we would try to partner with Pace. Um, with the football season, you know, we're looking at three or four home games maximum for a varsity football season. So again, in looking at partnering with Pace, again, having potentially more away games, which would then be recouped in the next season. Those are just kind of conversations that take place amongst athletic directors, um, you know, trying our best to make sure that our like seniors can have a senior game or some kind of experience on something that would be as close to a home game as possible. So I know that there has been some conversation in the past where football may be able to squeeze in a field over in the outfield of the baseball field. You know, I think that would be kind of like our last ditch effort is if we cannot find, you know, a partnership with Pace or, um, you know, being able to play on our own grounds to, to maybe look at that, you know, as, as a last option to try to get our kids an experience on, on a home field. And as far as practice in the football field, I know we used to years ago, bus down to the field near the railroad yard. Mm -hmm. um, Broken Landing? And mm -hmm. No, no, go down from Point. From Point, oh, past the railroad yard. they just yard. made into a cricket field? I guess if they made that into a cricket field. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but to answer the question, our football team practices in the outfield of the baseball field, so their practices wouldn't be impacted by anything. It really would just be game day in the fall season for our football and for our uh, soccer mm -hmm. and then um you know a slight impact also on like modified cross country their course you know currently ends on spencer field so those would be the teams in the fall that would have the most significant impact of of not being able to utilize spencer in the fall and lastly for me is anything in terms of uniform replacement obviously volleyball yep. is something you know other yeah so what i built in last year was a specific uniform line where we look at a four-year cycle for uniforms. So in continuing to look at just a uniform replacement cycle. So for instance, like our girls basketball team is due up. Um, I want to say our baseball team is due up. I have it here. Give me one second. But yes, we do have the continuous rotation of approximately a four-year cycle. So um, girls basketball, boys lacrosse, uh, the new team of volleyball, uh, varsity cross country is due, and our tennis teams. So, of course, there are always things that kind of come up last minute where even we need to get like a fill in for some sets that might have missing pieces. Um, but but that's also something that's included in our um, materials and supplies. So we don't have anything either at the lower level JV or modified where uniforms are really outdated and worn out. Where we're so okay. we, we also look we also look to try to help out our modified teams as much. Typically, what will happen is that we'll spill down the, the old varsity becomes the new JV. Uh, but trying to spill then JV down to modified, we'll see the kids <laughs> swimming in the uniforms. So the modified teams are also something that we look at replenishing whenever we can. You know, usually it's like a reversible uh, sure. uniform mm -hmm. or something that we can get multi use um, okay. out of. Great. Any other questions? All right. Okay. Next to present is Rachel DePaul, our Director of People Personnel Services. Got my title. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Hi, everyone. Good evening. I know. <laughs> Mine's the easiest. Out of um, so in the upcoming school year, the pupil personnel department is, um, you know, really working to support the district in developing a future driven school system. So through that work, we will be developing specialized programs, integrating embedded therapeutic services and onboarding a community school family liaison in the upcoming school year. So these are just some pictures that we've captured of our school support dogs, our SPARK program students. Um, I don't know if you guys met Maple, she's in the bottom. She is a pit, a rescue pit that is a uh, support dog here at the high school. Mm -hmm. Maple, she, her handler is um, Mr. Ray Ferrara, yes. Um, and then in the upper right-hand corner, we have Selena. She's a retired Guiding Eyes brood who supports our CET and our counseling program with her handler, Miss Robin Woolley. And I think we all know Duchess Streeny, <laughs> the famous Duchess Streeny, top left-hand corner, who splits her time at CET in the SPARK program and in our sensory gym and at PVC in the social studies department. <laughs> <laughs> um, next slide. So um, part of our goal and our, um, I guess our work for the upcoming school year is to enhance our current flexible support program. So you guys are very familiar with it, I'm sure, as is the community. A lot of our students access flex, you know, on a regular basis, scheduled, you know, into their schedule or as a stop-in, check-in program when they need some additional support or some time to kind of reset um, during their day. So currently, this program is led by a school psychologist, Ms. Leandra Ramirez, and there is a special education teacher in the program, Mr. David Xavier. So that team, along with an aide in the program, really has changed a lot of trajectories for our students. You know, we have a lot of fragile students that are returning back to school, you know, students that are just being released from hospitalizations, students struggling with school refusal and it's, uh, social anxiety. So the FLEX program here at the high school is really focused on providing that level of therapeutic support and academic support so students don't fall behind while they need that time away from the general population in the classrooms. Um, the middle school has a very similar structure where it is both a resource room period where there's academic supports for our students with disabilities as well as a space for students to gain some strategies, coping strategies to better equip themselves to deal with the demands of the school environment. So two items, two bullets here that really stand out to me and I wanna emphasize is that the FLEX program is a guided and safe socialization opportunity. So there are students, multiple students in a, during a period in the FLEX room. They may not know each other, but there's a common thread you know, with these students that builds relationships and builds a system of support. You know, so they may see each other in the lunchroom or out in the community. And, you know, there's a there's an awareness of, you know, how my needs are very similar to your needs. And if you need me, you know, I'm here for you. And I think the flex programs create that culture of caring and endorse that culture of caring here. Um, secondly, the flex program is an alternative to students being placed in more restrictive programs. You know, we have embedded therapeutic supports now through dialectical behavioral therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy strategies, and small group work that our clinicians lead in the FLEX programs. But by the students having the opportunity to remain in their homeschool district in their least restrictive environment, they're gaining the strategies, the academic exposure through our quality programs here, and that sense of home and community that helps students heal. So, in the upcoming school year, we will be integrating and implementing a consultation service with a developmental psychiatrist. So that psychiatrist is going to be performing, and um, pardon me, and um, she's going to be facilitating in-service training for our clinicians at both PVC and the high school. So bringing more of a clinical lens in with the consultation and support of a psychiatrist is going to really refine and develop this program into what we need it to be. The needs are growing. Like literally every week I'll get a call from the team and they're like, Rachel, but I'm like, oh, wow. okay, how are we gonna handle this this week? But they are so equipped and so proactive and responsive to the families and the needs of the children 
this consultation with a psychiatrist is only going to enhance what is already going on there. And there are great things going on in that program. Um, so with that, and I'm, I'm not sure if you guys know, but the most common psychiatric disorder for high school students or school age students is a disruptive behavior, disruptive mood disorder, anxiety disorders, and depression. Those are the most prevalent disabilities here in our program and our community as well. So we need to equip our staff to be able to address these needs and the growing number of students exhibiting, you know, these um, symptoms related to these disorders and needs. So having a clinician to consult with our staff, support families in making the connections with quality programs and services to create a wraparound system for our families and the students is essential. You know, our current clinicians have a resource bank, but when you look at someone that works at 50 school districts across New York State, you know, that gives us both a depth and a breadth of, of resources that, you know, we can tap into. Because Westchester County has been limited in their availability of, you know, on psychiatric supports and therapeutic supports since COVID. So, you know, we really have to kind of widen our net. And I think having that psychiatrist here present available to provide, you know, um, to have that two-way communication with treating psychiatrists to ensure that, you know, those um, strategies that are working in the treatment plan outside of school are now embedded inside of school are going to help our students be successful and be more present in school and in their community. Um, some other things I'd like to add about the embedded services. How does it benefit a school district? It opens the door to vast resources. As I mentioned, we're going to be increasing the capacity of our staff through these in-service professional development opportunities. Improving mental health awareness for staff and students. Some students don't understand what's actually going on in, you know, in FLEX. They're like, oh, so you're going to FLEX again, what, just to get out of math class? But, you know, there's a true need that the child sees you know, so that is their place to kind of just reset and regroup so that they can um, tackle the remainder of their school day and the demands of the school environment. Um, these embedded supports are also supporting a culture of acceptance and mutual support, you know, building that, you know, collegial bond, you know, between students. For example, we had a student that was out of school for a while due to school refusal. We developed a truncated plan with the flex team, the guidance counselors, the administration here. He actually got back in school after almost two and a half years of very interrupted attendance, which was a major success, a major success. He was even going out to lunch with kids that he met in Flex. Go, to go from being isolated at home in order to, and then such a major revelation be like, wow, people support me. People are like me here. It really created a whole different um, view for this child and a trajectory for him as well. And... Additionally, enhancing the reputation of a school district that focus on the quality of life for our students. You know, when a child is impaired by a disorder, anxiety, depression, their quality of life isn't what you would hope a teenager or an adolescent's, you know, quality of life to be. So we hope that with the new embedded therapeutic supports, um, pardon me, the increased embedded therapeutic supports, we can definitely work to touch and reach more students and families and improve their trajectories over the next few years while we still have them. <laughs> um, next slide. Rachel, I'm just on this. Yes. Slide. How do you envision the, the arrangement with the psychiatrist to be? Is it like a, uh, somebody that's on call or somebody that would be in-house? So my preliminary, pardon me, my preliminary conversations with the clinicians in both flex programs, they felt that a half day a month would be sufficient with the ability to virtual, you know, to Zoom and have her available X amount of days per month for consults. You know, there's cases arise, new cases arise, incidents arise where, you know, we may need a, a different lens into how to support that student. So we're thinking one full day in person in district with that split being um, PVC and the high school. Yeah. And then we'd have to designate an X amount of hours, I guess, per month where we, she would be available mm -hmm. to us. And that would be through BOCES? This provider is currently an independent contractor. We're contracting with this particular person now to provide um, more in-depth psychiatric evaluations for some of our students here. Yeah. So just following up on what Omar asked, in terms of the variety of different 
um, things that you said this consultant psychiatrist will do, professional development and assistance for our staff in flex and in special ed, and integration or interrelationship with the district and the treating psychiatrist and students, and being able to perhaps talk directly with parents and talk directly with you in special situations. Um, how, you know, that sounds to me like a lot of, a lot of stuff and a lot of time. I'm not saying it's not necessary. And I'm not saying it's not worth it. But I'm just wondering from um, an operational and financial aspect, how much do we anticipate in the budget? I'm sure it's not shown separately um, that we would be contracting for these services for next year. I believe it's captured in our contracted services line. Um, currently, she's performing psychiatric evaluations for us as needed. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we had anticipated an increase in that cost in the upcoming school year because we're, we want to integrate those consultations mm -hmm. and the in-person. Right now, she's available for us. You know, she sits on CSEs to review her reports. She, if there's a hot case, you know, a case that we really need her intervention and her insight into, she's available. So as far as cost or X amount of hours, we haven't really determined, you know, or quantified that specifically, but we're looking at a total of 10 days over the course of the upcoming school year. And that's in, in, in person. In yes. person. In person. Plus, obviously, at some hourly rate. Right. And the in person visits, that PD is embedded. So it doesn't have to be in isolation, like, all right, we're meeting on Tuesday to do this. Like, she will model the strategies, you know, that she hopes that our clinicians can carry over and, you know, continue to implement in her absence. So it's building capacity through her in-person, you know, um, her presence here in the district. And everything involving her work is going to be between her and our professionals, whether it's administration, you, or, or teachers and psychologists. And in regards to communication or exactly interaction? Right. Yes. No interactions directly okay. with parents with regard to any particular case or situation should phone be calls. Called. You know, phone she calls may, that she has so to follow. She may up have a phone call like follow up yes. with a particular parent about their child. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um our program. So when we met at one of my numerous interviews, I think I <laughs> I emphasized my passion for developing programs for students. The goal of a school district is to keep their children in the community to the best extent, you know, to the to the extent possible. So this upcoming school year is a beautiful opportunity for us to develop some really specialized programs to support our incoming kindergartners and our transitioning students. So um, currently we have a SPARK program. I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with that program. The acronym, the acronym stands for Student Preparation for Academic Routines and Knowledge. It's currently a K2 2-4 program at CET. So there's kind of two sections of it, two different age ranges, uh, grade bands. Um, so that program is supported by a behavior specialist. Um, she's there um, providing applied behavioral analysis, reinforcing behaviors, training aids to better support the students exhibiting some maladaptive behaviors to um, help support, God bless you, um, help that student get ready for learning. Um, so we're hoping to um, kind of weave in our incoming kindergartners that require specialized programs. And if we didn't have this opportunity with the SPARC, these five particular students may end up in out of district placements. So this is a beautiful opportunity for us to take that lower level SPARC program, the K-2, and really develop it around these particular students who have some significant needs, but our um, staff in the SPARC program is well-equipped to address the needs and, and help really promote growth and progress with these students. Um, additionally, we have a cohort that'll be transitioning to PVC. So they're entering into fifth grade, very specialized program where they will travel together. They will be taught by a certified special education teacher in a small setting to slow down the pace, address some of the social um, 
awareness issues that they have, really being, being um, available for the modeling of typically functioning peers in the uh, mainstream settings as well. Um, additionally, we have an eighth grade group coming up. So we're developing a cohort program here at the high school for them. So these are very specialized programs for this three or four, you know, cohort um, um, team <laughs> of students. Um, additionally, this also allows for us to start really marketing our programs. We've, you know, we've looked to take in some tuition-based students, you know, over the past uh, year and a half. Um, our goal is, and we have a very good reputation regionally, so it's really just making, you know, the programs as, um, I guess, as specialized and as focused as possible to meet the needs of our kids. And then if there is available seating, opening that up to other districts mm -hmm. that are seeking, you know, similar programs for their students. Um, so yes. Oh, also, our enrollment has gone up. <laughs> Yet our classification, our classified enrollment has gone down. So currently, we are at sixteen point three percent of our students are classified as a student with a disability. Last year, it was nineteen percent. So that is an attestation to the quality of instruction, the quality of intervention and remediation as well as the um, progress that the students are making in their specialized programs, that every three years when they're reevaluated, it's an opportunity for the CSC to consider if that student still meets the requirement for a disability. And at times, the instruction is just so targeted that it takes a very short amount of time for that child to really close the gap that they have. So that reduction in the classified student um, percentage of classified student is both that children aren't eligible at the Committee for Special Education. Um, they are um, declassified at their triennial or their reevaluation meeting. And um, I think that's a that's definitely something to shout out because that's general education teachers working together with interventionists, special education teachers, the quality of our evaluations and really targeting, you know, the students. So. I just wanted to shout that out. I actually have a question because I'm just curious, just going back to that, where exactly does that 252 number come from? Does that include things like anxiety and depression or is it more just learning disabilities? And then how, and then is that just the number through the school or do you get that number through any other ways? Like maybe students who, get treatment for things outside of the schools for like mental illnesses, but don't go through the schools to do it? So that's a great question. That's a great question. So the 252 um, students are classified as students with disabilities under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. So they fall under the umbrella of special education. So they have an educational disability. And at times a psychiatric or a mental illness can fall in there, you know, fall within that special education umbrella, under that umbrella. So that 252 are solely students that require specialized instruction or special education. The 504 accommodation plan, that could support students with anxiety, you know, um, depression. However, those disorders or those medical diagnoses don't adversely impact their access to education. So that's the difference. Um, special education, there's a barrier. There's something that is not allowing the child to have access to their general education, you know, curriculum and this, you know, the, the instruction. 504 is just a plan that supports a student and it's, it typically falls within the school age range, but can um, follow you to college. You can get an accommodation plan through the Office of Disabilities at a university or a college. Um, so the children that fall under a 504, just an accommodation plan, that's like extended time, um, distraction-free environment, um, you know, maybe copies of notes because they get anxious having to keep up with copying notes from the board. 504s are not included in the 252 oh, because they don't require any specialized program nor fall under that IDEA or the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. They are a number that is separate 
And I did not include that in my presentation tonight. Okay. But if you want that, I can provide that. <laughs> <laughs> and your your follow up, did you have another question outside of that? Uh, oh, no, I think that was it. <laughs> okay. All right, perfect. And here's our kids again, mm -hmm. our spark kids. So this was a slide I recycled from our November <laughs> presentation, <laughs> but I, I, adjusted it, I adjusted it a little bit. So um, during our presentation in November, when we spoke about how are we addressing the needs of our non-English speaking families in the Croton Harmon School District, we spoke about um, onboarding or really looking to create a position of a community liaison, school community liaison. We still haven't identified the actual title, but we know what we need that person to do to support us in reaching our families. So this graphic, the bottom graphic is, you know, our schools require some level of liaising or <laughs> support to get that information out to the homes and of the, the homes specifically of our non-English speaking families. So that's just a little graphic to capture that thing. Um, so our school community liaison, as I noticed, I think the title has been changed three times in, well, in, our, in my slides. Got to keep everybody on their toes. Is that what it is? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we had a very lengthy discussion at central administration, our um, administrative council, ENL teacher meetings, my communication with the school counselors that have a high number of Spanish speaking families that they work with. And we drafted a list of what do we foresee the responsibilities being of a liaison. So there were so many um, perspectives you know, that we have like a five page list, 11 font, you know, <laughs> bulleted of what we foresee this person doing, you know, in their work here. So we want to engage our non-English speaking families, specifically our Spanish speaking families in the community, help, help them make connections between the school, outside resources, um, any type of support they require to, to better um, support their child in their education and in the school environment. Um, assisting parents in navigating the digital online platforms. Dr. Blair and I, you know, we spoke at the beginning of the year, we need to like do some translated tutorials. So we were able to get, you know, some launched, right? Right around report card time, I think. Um, and that was very helpful for parents to navigate the backpack. So, um, you know, we need someone to help facilitate like maybe small training sessions to really reach the parents that um, have been limited in their access to these types of programs. Um, someone to communicate important information, be present at our community events. Dr. Dubeck had shared today that at their open house or welcome for the class of 2027, they had a pre-meeting with Spanish speaking families. Very nice turnout. I think all of two of the invitees, um, all but two, uh, yeah, two didn't attend, the rest did. <laughs> Um, so they had a translator there, you know, it was a very intimate session, but there was a level of comfort, which, you know, really made people want to come out and be engaged in the, um, event. Additionally, having some support during the registration and entry to school, that is essential. You know, over the past, uh, two months since January, thank Christmas break, we've had five non-English speaking families register at CET. And it, it, you know, it's definitely a, um, it's tough, you know, to try and help support them through the process, you know, with the language barrier. But luckily, we do have someone there that, you know, has been supporting us in supporting the families and getting all the documents they need and trying to transition them as, you know, as um, quickly as possible into the school environment. Um, so this is really a goal of ours. We've been trying to identify how to best you know, market or try to recruit for this position, as well as, you know, how we will um, kind of allocate time amongst the three schools and central office. So, the numbers. Okay, I have to get my notes. <laughs> I have to put on my PPS. I can tell. I have to put on my PPS. <laughs> um, so, I think this looks very nice for a special education <laughs> yeah, for my finance team. There. Is that there's a beautiful delta. <laughs> so it appears <laughs> that there's a 1.1% increase in the people personnel budget. 
And I have been known to be the queen of efficiencies, mm -hmm. <laughs> just saying. <laughs> so there has been some movement from our residential placements to private placements or BOCES programs. And that is through the work of the CSE, the quality of the programs and the time that the child spent in a residential so that it was time for them to come back to their homeschool community. They were ready. And we're seeing successes in the students that we've transitioned back. So that's why you'll see a decrease in the residential tuition and you know increases in either the private tuition or the public, mm -hmm. um, pardon me, uh, BOCES tuition. You know, our go-to is typically BOCES programs because they're so diverse. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we look to um, make referrals for students, we go to BOCES first. And then we see if they require something a little bit more intensive or more specialized or more restrictive, then we look to the privates, the privates. But for the upcoming school year, as it stands, there's a major reduction in the number of kids that are in a residential facility through the CSC. Um, you will see that there is an increase in contractual services where we're, um, that integrates our contractor who provides the physical therapy in district, mm -hmm. Edgenuity, which is a um, credit recovery online student-driven um, program to retain credits, like if they're out for long periods of mm -hmm. time or they just have one credit maybe in order to um, satisfy, in order to graduate. That's a program that we utilize um, for that. Um, sub nurses is, you know, an expense that has increased mm -hmm. recently. Um, and sub nurses are in contractual services. Yes. In mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and psychiatric evaluations and psychiatric consultations all fall within that. Um, additionally, the supplies budget has an increase because we've absorbed the school's budgets into the PPS budget, like the clinicians um, work, special education teacher material orders and such, we've absorbed into the department. But I believe that's it's 1.1% on my guess. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the devil's in the detail. Right? <laughs> it is. Talk a more, it's such a huge variance, mm -hmm. uh, the residential tuition. Mm -hmm. what's, what's in there? What changed from this year? The next year. So last year we had probably three students in residential, and that's an exorbitant amount of money. You know, there's the tuition for the ac academic program, there's the residential fees, and there's the maintenance and dormitory fees. I think there's a three component um, fee for each student that attends a residential program in state and any approved out of state programs. So one student moved. So we discharged in the fall. So we were able to remove that student from the upcoming year's budget. Um, we had another student that was in a residential treatment facility. That student made significant gains and wanted to come back to their school community. The CSE developed a very, very supportive individualized education plan to support that student in a private day program here in the state. Um, and additionally, one more. One student's aging out. We'll be 21 in June. So that's, I think right now we're looking at one to one and a half students, you know, for the upcoming year versus what we had in the past. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Is that yeah. yeah. And in, in all fairness, this is the most unpredictable. It is. And <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. What you can see what that will, will be at the end of the year could flip all of these. It could. Up yeah. right it could. So yeah. it's a matter of making predictions based on what we know today mm -hmm. and then adjusting throughout the year. Mm -hmm. But again, this you see the numbers uh, of these placements. So it's extremely volatile. We try to prepare and plan for the worst case scenario, not always the case, even when we think we're predicting for the worst case scenario. A child which, needs an aid, yeah. you know, in yeah. order to maintain safety. And that's yeah. almost $70,000. You know, those those are mm. incidentals almost. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't plan for those, you know. For mm -hmm. I, um, two questions about the school community liaison. Um, given your presentation a few months ago, too, and all that you said tonight, um, is is one enough? <laughs> <laughs> and do you have any numbers, I guess, just um, in terms of the ratio of liaison to need um, to the families or no. people in need? 
No, no, because the liaison isn't going to like we know our ENL numbers, our students that require, you know, English language um, <laughs> services. Right. However, there are still families that are non English speaking. And I think we went, you know, through that in that right. November presentation. My count, based on information that was shared with me from the PVC um, person who kind of maintains a listing or directory of non English speaking families, I think there's 128 non English speaking families. So in, they could potentially in the, in be the in the district. In the, I'm sorry, not, yes. not PVC. Oh no, no, in the district. Okay. No, because the the list grows mm -hmm. with the the yeah. kids, and they kind of compile one list so okay. that in the event that we need to reach, you know, reach out, we kind of have one directory. But mm -hmm. as I said, five new families just moved in between right. June and today. Yeah. So what the ratio would be. And then fun is six to one. So the question still stands. <laughs> it, I, it does. One and a, I think yeah. it's a it's a step mm -hmm. in the right direction. Um, and I I'm not sure if the need is as consistent. It may be seasonal. Mm -hmm. Like our ENL teachers developed a timeline. Like you know, in August we need to send out the open house notices in another you know in another language in a second language. Make phone calls to ensure that you know they received it. They're ready to get their kids on the bus. They have access. So mm -hmm. I think it's it's seasonal. It's it could be, um, you know, it's kind of scheduled or predictable to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. But then there are times where a family walks in, they have a question. And at this point, we have no one to translate for them. Mm -hmm. So to know that, you know, Miss Marmalejos is at PVC. Can you run over to CET? We have a family here that needs some support. Mm -hmm. You know, so I, it may be a reach for one, two, but I think it's our best um, plan to move forward in looking to attain the goals and, re and engage our, our non-English speaking and Spanish speaking families. And then just the second part, um, I know you said there's like pages and pages of what that respons <laughs> their responsibilities might be, but um, was academic support considered or is that is that part of the role? No, um, it's a non-instructional no. position. Okay. So it's more yeah, I, I wouldn't even say it was clerical, but it's definitely not an instructional mm -hmm. um, position. You no know, direct contact providing instruction to students. It's more supporting families mm -hmm. so that they're equipped to support the children. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I have a question going back to the consultation services with the psychiatrist. Um, I know you had said that that was in the contractual services line. Are we, is that in addition to the services that that particular professional is already applying? Like, we're we're using that person for if it was an addition to it, or is it more an element of economy that would encompass what they're already doing for us? So now, I, right now, as it stands, she's conducting the psychiatric evaluations as needed, um, potentially sitting on CSEs to review her evaluation, and she contacts parents to review the evaluation or gain more information to, um, to write her um, evaluation. So right now, she's not doing any in-person necessarily contact with our clinicians. So that would be the additional support that we require from her. But when I asked for, you know, a proposal, I said, bundle it. You know what I mean? Bundle it. Like if we need to work within the confines of five hours a month in total, let's just say, and, and let me extend that, let's say 20 hours a month in total, you know, 10, five hours a day at PVC, five hours once a day, once a month at PVC, five hours at the high school, the additional hours would be used for consultation, writing reports, sitting on CSEs, reviewing cases, and, you know, helping us develop treatment plans. So we look at it more holistically and program mm -hmm. that like a package so deal with it. But I think just in terms of services, there will not be a decrease in the services already provided for the psychological, uh, psychiatric reviews, et cetera, but for services um, for the consult consultation with the clinicians is kind of the second part yes. of an expanded relationship. Well, it would become the <laughs> primary part, right. you know, the, her primary responsibility right. here, because right now the evaluations are as needed. We don't conduct psychiatric mm -hmm. evaluations for everyone. But when we're looking for out-of-district placements that require a psychiatric evaluation, the quality of these particular evaluations is superior. And they really give, give us as a CSE the insight into how we can best meet that child's needs academically, um, therapeutically in a school, and also making recommendations for the family for outside mm -hmm. supports and things that would work, given strategies. So you know. from a budgetary or um, contractual perspective, are you 
envisioning that the contract would be not to exceed Most likely, per month, yeah. but knowing that the commitment is the five hours to PVC, five hours of yeah, ice, half a day, and then two and a half, totally, so yeah. yeah, and then total not to exceed yes. 20 or 25 or whatever. That's how I would envision the contract okay. being, at least for the in-person work, you know, we'd have to kind of, you know, cushion because evaluations, the request for evaluation varies, right. you know, and, so. And there might be things that come up. That yeah. You don't want to have a situation well exactly you know you ran out your clock forget i'll <laughs> sorry i'll talk to you catching that i'll one. talk to you in, in april <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we can't afford you this one <laughs> right. the, the private tuition doses mm -hmm. the rise in cost is it is it at all a factor or driven by the the age of the population of students that are being served no, it's varied. At BOCES specifically, it's varied. So for BOCES, we have a second grader up to an age, a student that's aging out, turning 21 in June mm -hmm. at BOCES. Mm -hmm. So we have kids at, you know, the element, the Walden School, the Fox Meadow, and, you know, like the Tech Career Services Center. So there are students, there are students that span the different grade bands through yeah. the BOCES program. So the privates, those are very specialized as well. The lowest grade we have placed at a private, I would say is probably, there's a fourth grader uh, that's transitioning to fifth, but outside of that, it's mainly upper intermediate, so yeah. seven, eight and high school. And those students, I would love to develop programs to bring them, but there's yeah. not a co an established cohort at this time. You know, because so they're spread out. They're across. spread out, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And you know, 36 month age range, but still these students are all, um, regions bound essentially, or you know, uh, credential will be credentialed yeah. upon commencement. So it's too hard to group them. Like they can't kind of travel together to different mm -hmm. classes because their yeah. you know their yeah. trajectories yeah. are a little bit varied. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. So to close us out. Mm -hmm. Close us out. We have Dr. Darren Blair, our Director of Technology and Innovation. Good evening, everyone. Um, so as the Director of Technology and Innovation, it is my vision uh, to harness technology and innovation through the procurement of tools, enhancement of our learning spaces, mm -hmm. and the evolution of the innovation team in ways that encourage, support, and nurture the development of Chufsty into a future-driven school system. I think it's also important to note, as you know, this year we've um, had our faculty and our administration pursue passion projects. The majority of my budget development and my vision around it has been inspired by a lot of those passion projects, because as you <laughs> could imagine, there's a lot of passion in the use of technology and education. So first uh, slide here, we'll focus on tools. So believe it or not, our one-to-one Chufsty device program is going into its fourth year. Um, so this program was designed initially to uh, provide equity and access to a device for all of our students. That includes, as a reminder, new iPads for our kindergarten students, um, and then a brand new Chromebook for our first graders, our fifth graders, and then our ninth graders. Um, obviously, at the high school, we have our bring your own <clears throat> device program, but we do provide a device if they choose to um, take that device. As we know, with the one to one device program, as ubiquitous as it is, it doesn't always fit the need. So if you remember last year, we updated the um, laptops that are associated with the computer science program. Mm -hmm. This year, we'll be updating laptops associated with our engineering program. Um, so every year I try to find a space that needs new technology that's not um, it's not uh, enhanced by the the one to one device. Um, in addition to that, uh, Principal Plotkin at the um, principal's budget presentation uh, introduced the Z space technology. I just wanted to highlight that here. It's in the center image and with the white background. Um, so uh, Mr. Plotkin was at a regional conference and was exposed to the technology and he came back and he was like, you've got to see this. Um, so we actually brought the rep on site and I, I played with it and it was really awesome. Um, it is a, it looks just like a laptop in front of you. It has a small camera attached to the side. It does not require a headset, which is, um, that's a pretty innovative application of the 3D space, but the stylus allows you to actually click on and rotate 
the object that um, you're referencing as well as pull it apart. So we looked at everything from butterflies and cocoons, um, a heart that we pulled apart. Um, and uh, Mr. Plotkin had numerous ideas and ways in which that could enhance the program at PVC. So we'll pilot it there next year. Um, so we're really excited about that. Um, I also noticed an increased uh, need for technology access within the arts. Um, specifically in our art classrooms and our music classrooms. Mm -hmm. So we'll be investing in technology um, around that. I know just to highlight one example of that, Mrs. O'Brien, um, she's really interested in piloting iPads to display the music that are on a special stand that then a pedal could advance the music. Mm -hmm. So therefore we're reducing printing costs and purchasing of paper music. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just one example. Um, and then our Promethean Interactive Flat Screen Displays, you've heard that name Promethean. It is the new New Line to us. Um, so when I came in, New Line was exciting, but there was always that, yeah, but it's not exactly what I want it to be. So we spent some time at the end of the school year last year really investigating which product was the best product for us. Um, and Promethean came back as the resounding uh, piece of technology that the teachers really appreciated. It's important to note that Promethean was a company that was founded by educators and continues to be run by educators. And you can really feel that when you use the technology. It's just very intuitive. There's a lot of features, including just a centralized button that pops up a, a series of apps, including a spinner and a timer. Those pieces of technology that you want fast access to mm -hmm. as an educator. There, um, we had a, a need for some training. So I had highlighted in one of my reports recently that um, we had a trainer come in and Abigail was incredible. She was a hit and she was a former kindergarten teacher. So they're employing uh, former teachers. So it's it's just been a, a real great success. So I actually have new line users that are asking when they'll get it for me. <laughs> Um, but I'm excited to announce that at the end of the next school year, CET will be fully transferred from the smart board technology to the flat screen technology. Um, I've tried to really uh, be purposeful in the placement of those screens so that our kindergarten group last year will have a screen um, in their experience and in their classroom for the entirety of their experience at CET. So obviously the next step is to replace um, those at PVC and the high school, we're getting there, um, really replacing those smart boards that need the most help <laughs> that have failing projectors and pieces, um, but we'll continue that upgrade. So that's exciting. For our learning spaces, um, in addition to our engineering laptops, we have a desktop Max for um, an art room here at the high school and also our video production lab. And those Macs are aging. Um, they're about five years old. So it's about time to replace those. Um, but we will be working this spring uh, real intently with our teachers of those two spaces and um, our developers at Apple to determine the best solution, because there's some ideas that uh, iPads, iPad Pros especially, mm -hmm. may be the way to go um, with maybe some anchored displays throughout the room. So I'm really excited to investigate that and get those teachers um, real uh, kind of invested in kind of the future of those spaces. So that's planned as well. We also have a lot of teachers as part of the Passion Projects piloting multiple displays. You see in the bottom left corner, that's just one example. That's Joe Strainy's room. Um, so he has a very long kind of narrow room. So he uh, has a new Promethean display and he has also anchored, um, you see one TV in the back and then there's actually another one on the other side. So there's three displays in that room. So no matter where the students are, especially in those kind of cluster groups, they can kind of find where they need to be anchored. And then they also have the ability to cast at each of those spaces. Um, so you might have smaller presentation groups throughout that space. So we have quite a few individuals that are starting to build on that pocket of innovation. Uh, DJ mentioned the flat screens at CET. 
Um, that will be really interesting because those will be embedded within the mats. So they're also interactive, right? So they can be touched um, and that's exciting. We'll have one on each side of the divider wall. Uh, the golf simulator, of course, is really exciting. We'll start that at PVC, and I'm sure we'll probably have one of the high schools. <laughs> <laughs> like, and then utilizing mobile technology. I've had a lot of requests from teachers. So uh, before I started, all of the teachers were outfitted with brand new laptops, um, but they were all the same device, right? And all of us have preferences, like I'm, I have my Mac. Um, and so I have a lot of teachers who have the desire to get away from being anchored to a desktop um, and it's attached to their display and having some sort of mobile device like an iPad to walk around with, maybe be able to annotate notes that then show up on the displays around the room. Um, so we'll be really utilizing some pockets of innovation in that sense as well. Next one. So when we talk about passion projects, the innovation team is something that brings me passion. Steve and I spoke about this recently. It's something that brings a smile to my face and you all had the opportunity to engage in what the innovation team has brought to the district at the January 19th meeting. So thank you again for that. Um, we will continue the innovation team um, next year. That won't require budget because those are just meetings of the minds. Um, but I am proposing the establishment of the Chufsky Disruptors, which is an offshoot of the innovation team. It would be a collection of individuals that are ready to disrupt education with technology. Um, so the core of that model would be action research through the lens of disruptive innovation theory. It is actually a theory. You can take a look at it. Um, and we would um, utilize that almost as like a beta team. We can trial, we can pilot, we can test. And it's a place where we can take safe, thoughtful risk taking um, and pilot those emergent technologies and strategies. Um, so that will require budget, obviously, but I've incorporated that into um, some natural supply materials and supplies funding um, that would allow the purchase and the procurement of the tools to allow for that type of disruptive technology um, engagement. And the idea is, again, I've, I've said pockets of innovation, right? And disruptive innovation theory is rooted in the idea that we utilize pockets of innovation that then produce small victories and wins and have ultimately um, diffused throughout the system. So that's uh, something that I'm really excited to jump into next year. In terms of numbers, so this looks, yeah, question, go for it. Yeah, going back to your disruptor. Team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're looking to ideally take a uh, faculty yeah and absolutely. then have them and then pilot programs through that and correct okay yeah and and the idea would be uh try to build equal representation from each of our three buildings um potentially have some summer engagement um and outfit all of them with whatever kind of individual tools choice um i'd like to get to a place eventually where in this district we have a new hire come on board and we say what device do you want instead of saying here's a dell <laughs> or right, sure. I think that's not that's not the world we live in. That's also not the world that our high school students necessarily mm -hmm. live in, right? We allow them to bring their own device. The teachers should have the same opportunity and options. So um, we'll get there. That takes a, a different scope in terms of planning and budgeting for. Um, but I think that it would be really interesting to engage a group that's ready to just break those barriers, right? We talk about barriers a lot in terms of our strategic planning and our goals. Thank you. Of course, yes. So I understand the desire to, we, we have this sort of horizontal strata, which is the, the strata across K through four, mm -hmm. five through eight, and nine through 12. But there's also tend when it comes to technology, that tends to often be um, a strata in, a, in the opposite, uh, in the in the perpendicular direction, where there tend to be silos of, you know, 
math and science feels this way, and social studies maybe feels this way, and ELA feels this other way, um, and uh, has different, perhaps sometimes have different needs. Mm -hmm. And we already talked about the fact that that in the art department they they want math, yeah, because that's where the software that they use it. Um, similarly for engineering, um, how do we? I mean, are you thinking about how we break down some of those silos so that parts of the, you know, sort of the parts of the of, of the school community that have had more difficulty adopting technology or more diff uh, or where perhaps the technology they have is not suited exactly to their needs is um, better addressed? Yeah, I think that I, I, I totally agree with you and i think that the disruptors platform would have the capacity to bring people from different disciplines and different buildings together to find some commonalities or maybe encourage the differences right to ensure that then those pockets filter out into the rest of the system i think this is it's just a it's an interesting opportunity uh, a, a place to trial and and figure out mm -hmm. how to maybe build some commonality between those individuals. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is one way to do that. But I agree with you, and I do think that that's something that we continually look at. Mm -hmm. Like we, the question has mm -hmm. risen: Are Chromebooks the right device for our students? Right in terms of where they're at and where what they'll be using when they leave this mm -hmm. system. Right. So, you know, it's a fair question, but those are all pieces. It's not my decision to make, right? I want everyone to be involved and actually um, have a say in, in those decisions through these structures. So for our numbers, um, so we'll see the increase in the salaries line um, is primarily due to our database specialist um, was funded primarily through federal um, funding, especially as a result of COVID, I believe, okay. right? So that obviously will be coming to an end. So that's going to be absorbed into the technology and innovation budget. Mm -hmm. um, E-rate equipment. So E-rate is, is our process where we um, utilize federal funds to make infrastructure upgrades. Um, it is not required that you apply for E-rate funding every year. We applied for quite a bit of funding last year um, due to server upgrades. Um, so we're actually going to wait for those monies to kind of come in and make sure that that's all accounted for before we continue to move on. We will be participating still in Category 1 services, which include Internet service. Uh, but the category two, which are the main infrastructure upgrades, we, we will not be submitting for the E-rate funding, but we will still be doing those upgrades um, because we have a, a schedule of upgrades mm -hmm. every single year. So I've just moved that amount of money into the contractual services line. So that's where you'll see the, the negative balance on the E-rate equipment line and then partial um, increases in the contractual services line. Mm -hmm. There's also a large change in the BOCI services line because we are um, anticipating a move from procuring infinite campus through BOCES and procuring it directly through Custom Incorporated, which is the parent company of infinite campus, which um, the decision for that really involves giving our database specialist who has a high level of knowledge and expertise direct access to that company as opposed to the servicing piece that happens through BOCES. Mm -hmm. It's almost like BOCES tends to be a middleman in, in terms of our servicing and it stalls us and it, it actually takes more time to um, solve problems. So that's the there's a main major change. Um, the eighty eight thousand dollars is about how much Internet Campus costs for us. So that has also been added to our contractual services line. So that's uh, accounts for those large changes. Software has increased so much. I've done a um, pretty good job, I believe, at maximizing our software and ensuring that we're not repeating software. So we have actually decreased in that. Uh, capacity, but we've added a $4,000 coding software that has become very popular with our students called CodeMonkey. 
um, and they move the little monkeys around to get bananas, uh, <laughs> but it's a lot more complicated. <laughs> uh, so that that has been a hit. Um, so that accounts for the increase. We also are um, incorporating all of our special education software under um, the technology and innovation budget because that's where it really belongs. Um, so you'll notice about a $10,000 increase for that. Uh, purpose. And then it looks like we're spending less on supplies and materials due to the fact that last year was a server year. That's about a $75,000 difference. Um, so server years happen about every four to five years. Um, so we're done with that for a little while. Can you tell me the budget increase, if the $10,000 in software would have gone on Rachel's budget, would it still be 1.1% or? <laughs> no. Uh, so, 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 so you're well. I think there you go. You all got to take a hit every once in a while. <laughs> Mine looks messy, but. Um, yeah. Sure. It's a dead specialist list. Like, yeah. 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 Where in the, um, where in this, is it through traffic services or is it through BOCES that are um, parent square? Uh, yes, Parent Square um, technically falls under BOCES because we procure that software okay. through the BOCES line. But it actually, I believe Parent Square may not be on my budget line. I think it's actually part of the communications budget line. Uh -huh. okay. um, the other piece I did, I did drop budgets. off um, <laughs> was under contractual services. There was also a large delta increase due to the fact that we are adding that third tech, right? Um, so right. you know that we started that piloted the third part-time network engineer level one um, from Edutech. That has been incredibly successful. Um, I have some data to share with you in tomorrow's memo, um, this week's uh, tech and innovation memo about, uh, it shows you how our tickets, open tickets have actually fallen mm -hmm. um, quite a, significantly since the addition of that tech. Um, and we also have some interesting uh, information about where the majority of our tickets come from, and they actually come majority from CET, and that's where our third tech has been housed and has become quite beloved. So it's working very well. Um, so I'd like to continue that. Josh? What percentage of our data storage would you say is on-prem versus cloud? Mm, good question. Um, so all of our student information system information, uh, Infinite Campus is all cloud-based. Mm -hmm. um, I would say if I had to gauge a percentage off the top of my head, I would say that we have probably 65% cloud-based information. And then the rest is housed internally on our servers. Um, most districts are moving to more cloud-based mm -hmm. uh, because of vulnerabilities. Um, we have a local district, Chappaqua, says um, that school districts are not 24-hour uh, call centers, right, which we're not. Um, so there, there's advantages, but there's also disadvantages, and we have to weigh those. A lot of it comes down to price. Um, or, you know, so we, we do pride ourselves on the cybersecurity pieces that we've uh rolled out. We did the blue orange cybersecurity mm -hmm. audit uh, last year, and that has been really helpful. We'll be continue. I'll be continuing with a cybersecurity um, cohort that is being established at PNW BOCES next year. Um, so those those steps to mitigate any type of cyber attack do help justify our local storage. Right. But it's a good question. I'm always in, I'm interested in this because I'm, I'm I worry about the the physical plant risk, sure. right? Absolutely. Uh, where you know, with a, a single server in a server room somewhere, all it takes is a pipe burst, sure. You know, and that's why I always think about. Or for that matter, I also think about you know things like ransomware attacks, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and there are school districts not too far away that have been seriously compromised. Yeah. That's always my thought. Um, <laughs> thankfully, we've been we've been pretty secure. Um, teacher, teacher <laughs> desktop <laughs> machines. You mentioned the teachers moving away from desktop machines uh, more and more. Uh, is that a large portion of the uh, of the on prem storage? The uh, like growing uh, uh, no home, home, home profiles are very very little um, is stored on home profile. 
Uh, we do have the network drives. We're trying to encourage more and more use of Google Drive. Okay. Um, it's not then mandated. I mean, I, I know in my practice, I was I was mandated to use Google Drive in 2014, right? It, yeah. But it's that's a cultural piece, and that's oh, a yeah. that's a big shift. It takes yeah. a lot of time. It took a, it, we get, we were given two years to make the total shift. Um, so I think that if you place certain structures um, within the system, such as allowing for the, what we used to call file stream, right? With right. The, like that home environment um, aspect to transfer files easily, to access them when they're on those devices, that makes that process much easier. So I've started trickling that into the system for people that are ready for it. Um, but you bring up a great point. Mm -hmm. I, 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 what I'm trying to get at is I'm trying to understand what is what is the source of the need, what what tooling that our staff and faculty and students are using demands the on it really needs the on prem. It's actually the majority of our on prem um, storage is our our business software. Um, gotcha. which is, you know, that, that is, um, that's, that's a difficult one to put into the cloud. I think a lot of districts have difficulty with that. Yeah. People do it by, by spinning up, essentially spinning up, uh, cloud servers that are, it, it's, it's still the same server. Yeah. It's just running on in, in cloud, which exactly. that presents other, then you're not really gaining very much by doing that. Right. So right. It's, it's, it's just a different single point of failure. Yeah. Agreed. <laughs> hmm. Good questions. Yeah. Um, if the campus is it cost is the cost any different now that you're going directly? So yes, the um there is a twenty thousand dollar service fee that's added at BOCES that's not added when we go direct yeah. through custom. So yes, there is a savings there. Oh, thank you for yes. that. But on the flip question. side, we don't get the, the, the eight. We don't lose the we it's not right. eight. Yes, we lose, we lose yes. that eight. Yeah, so it's it's a it's a bit of a wash when you really look at it. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm trying to approach it from the standpoint that it will increase productivity mm -hmm. for our database specialist um, significantly. Okay. And the other part of the question is, you had said you're you're upgrading technology, but not applying it to the e ring. Correct. The yeah. network infrastructure. So we have the opportunity to apply for category two funding, but there's a there's always a cap on that. Yeah. Um, so we're actually getting quite close to our cap, especially after the server year. Mm -hmm. So prior to the server year, we were we were um, applying for anywhere from fifty to seventy five thousand dollars. The server year was one hundred and seventy thousand dollars. So we're Again, we're going to wait until all of because all of the upgrades have to be made, and then you have to submit the paperwork. It's a lengthy process, so we'd like all of. We were actually given the recommendation. Um, we outsource the management of the process um, so that it's uh, done with fidelity um, with a, a company called E two E. So it was actually their recommendation that we hold off and wait until all of those monies come in mm -hmm. so that we can make. Um, you know, better decisions in terms of category two, but we are still planning for 70, 000, $60,000, $70,000 worth of network upgrades next year, including switches um, and access points at the high school. I'll be starting to replace all of our access points um, one building at a time so that they're all up. So it's not an annual requirement to... No. It, it, no. What, you can do it over and over. What's the time frame? You know? They they continue to extend. Yeah, it. Okay. they yeah. continue to extend it because a lot of districts don't capitalize on it for mm -hmm. school districts and libraries to, through the FCC. Mm -hmm. um, but now there is an initiative to offer funding for cybersecurity, mm -hmm. which is a, a big push, and that would be highly beneficial to yes. us. Yeah, the, yes. the, uh, the majority of regional technology directors uh, signed a, a letter a, a statement. In indicating the need for the funding for the cybersecurity measures, mm -hmm. even just the insurance alone mm -hmm. is expensive. Oh, yeah. Right. So, yeah. The, the upgrades to APs, mm -hmm. that's, is that to increase bandwidth or just because they're reaching out a lifespan? It's or? both. It's both. And we'll go with the high school first because we have the greatest diversity of de devices that are accessing 
um, those specific points. So we want to make sure that this building in particular is at the highest level of uh, innovation. I have to say that this is something that I really appreciate. Our what we've been doing in terms of our network availability and availability of uh, of bandwidth, we frankly have been doing a better job than a lot of other districts that I've visited, and um, and the fact that we have the flexibility to do that makes makes a big difference. Yeah. I think every day for our students not having the friction of. Um, uh, that, that's associated when there's network difficulties of the fact that it's available. That's great. Thank you. And I think I, that's a testament to my predecessor, right, and, and her careful planning. And I also think that our partnership with Edutech ensures that we have uh, a strong understanding of where we need to go in terms of our network and our infrastructure. And Windows 11 is coming soon. Um, so that's exciting. You know, John is really excited. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go in there. Oh, <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Any other questions for Jerry? All right. Thank well, you. thank you all very yeah. much for the presentation. Yes, you absolutely can take off if you would like. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we have some more uh, more on our agenda, but I thank you. Bye thank you. Everyone oh, wants to not not for you, just you. So no. you guys can still pack it. What, 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 what do we still need to talk about? I assume administrative budget, um, board budget lines, whatever. Right. So next um March, yes, that's March yeah, 23rd. Yeah. I will keep on to say 22nd, 23rd. We will have an overview of all departmental budgets, tax practice, etc. And and we'll be talking about it will be the full it, like, budget central office, like the uh, the board lines and full budget communications, whatever we have. Yeah. And incidentally, the um, parent square, so that is covered in our communications okay. budget, and that is a net zero increase uh, compared From to our K current platform, which is the K-12. Yeah, so um, it's basically it's flat. I like that. Yes. Yeah. Better program saving more money. <laughs> That's good. Um, all right. So is everyone uh, ready to shift uh, so, out of <laughs> budget mode? And we will move on to our uh, to the next meeting of the agenda, which is our donations. Uh, recommended action that the Board of Education gratefully accepts a donation in the amount of $700 from the American Heart Association for the purchase of physical education equipment and supplies at the Carrie E. Tompkins Elementary School. So moved. Second. On the question? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Recommended action that the Board of Education gratefully accepts a donation in the amount of $1,000 from Mark Franzoso as a contribution to the Erica Aleskis Memorial Scholarship at Croton Harmon High School. So moved. Second. On the question? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Recommended action that the Board of Education gratefully accepts a donation in the amount of $500 from the Croton Police Association as a contribution towards a scholarship at the Croton Harmon High School. So moved. Second. On the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Recommended action that the Board of Education gratefully accepts a donation of $200 from Eric Kohler and New York Life as a contribution to the Carrie E. Tompkins General Fund. So moved. Second. On the question, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. All right. I would like to take the moment to uh, thank again all of our donors for considering our students uh, and, and supporting them. We very much appreciate it. Um, we'll now move into new business. Recommended action, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Croton Harmon Union Free School District hereby appoints Mark Maxim as acting principal of the high school during the period of time that the principal of the high school is on her leave of absence, anticipated to be on or about May 15, 2023, to on or about November 11, 2023. 
and that during such time, Mr. Maxim will have all the powers and duties of the building principal, including but not limited to the authority to suspend students out of school for five days or less. So. Second. On the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion. Oh, Aye. yep. Thank Aye. you. Josh. Motion carries. Recommended action that the Board of Education approves the CTA side letter of agreement for an unpaid leave of absence for Erica Fiorini from her position of Dean of Students as presented. So moved. Second. On the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. Recommended action, be it resolved that the Board of Education of the Crow and Harmon Union Free School District hereby appoints Erica Fiorini as acting assistant principal of the high school during the period of time that the principal of the high school is on her leave of absence, anticipated to be on or about May 15th, 2023, to honor about November 11th, 2023. And during such time, Ms. Fiorini will have all the powers and duties of the assistant principal. So moved. Second. On the question. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? I'm abstain. Motion carries. We will now move into policies for first reading. The Board of Education will conduct a first reading on the following policies. Policy 2310, regular meetings, which is a revision. Policy 2340, notice of meetings, which is also a revision. And policy 2360, minutes, which again is a revision. Neil, did you want to speak sure. to any of these before? I will speak to them very briefly. Um, the policy revisions and uh, policy um, rescission of 2360R, which we will talk about in a moment, are basically essentially minor uh, with regard, though, to policy 2360. That revision is being made because the minutes of the meeting as minute meeting minutes as set forth in the original policy 2360 and 2360 are the regulation, or the policy that was in put in place in 1994 has never been updated and really does not accord with what uh, a board how board is required to maintain and keep as uh, information and in our in our formal minutes and um, exclude certain things that we are supposed to have in those minutes. So that's the reason for the update. And while it may seem to be in 2360 a rather substantial revision, which it is, it's really just to um, bring the policy up to what has been our practice and what is our requirements. And if there are any questions, send them to me. The policy committee will be meeting before our next business meeting so we can deal with any questions that people may have. And I'll, I'll say just to say before it later, that meeting is on March 27th. So get comments or questions to us uh, sufficiently advanced on March 27th so that we can discuss. Yeah. All right. Um, and then since I've already talked about 4.5. Right. And we have talked about 4.5, which is the uh, rescission 2360R. So, again, anybody who has any questions, please let the policy committee know, and we will put these. We expect to have them on for uh, second reading and adoption uh, at the next business meeting. All right. We will now move into consent agenda. Recommended action that the Board of Education approves uh, all items on the consent agenda. So moved. Second. On the question? On the question. <laughs> um, just wanna uh, make the public aware the, in the consent agenda is the contract for the yacht, which is the eighth grade graduation dance, which mm -hmm. here is uh, the chatter's all over town about them. <laughs> um, if any family, uh, the cost of the ticket, I 
the range between seventy and eighty dollars. Seventy dollars. Yeah. Point. If any family has has uh, issues uh, coming up with with the ticket price, please contact Mr. Plotkin. There is a um, the ACE grant. There is funding for students that have um, challenges paying that. So we did not want to um, exclude any, any student from this event uh, based on the ticket price. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Motion carries. All right, we will now move into the version of the meeting, which will open up our second uh, hearing of public. Does anyone want to come address the board? Any members of the public? <laughs> well, uh, in that case, I, we, will, we will move on from hearing of public. And we will move into board reports. Our uh, first up is advocacy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, it's a, it's been a little bit. Since uh, we had. All right. Advocacy <laughs> notes. We, um, Sarah and I both attended the um, meeting, uh, Zoom meeting with and run by West Park mm -hmm. with the legislators in our area on the 9th of February. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess uh, I can basically say we had a rather uh, extensive discussion where each legislator was given the opportunity to speak. And we actually, I think, had. Um, on different topics, there were four topics. Each one was introduced by a facilitator, um, either from West Park or from the local uh, Law Arts and Council School Superintendents. And they were very open, the legislators, I would say, <laughs> in discussing what they thought would happen, what the areas that they thought we could be effective in, in advocacy, areas that they felt that there might be uh, difficulty in pushing the governor's office about making changes, whether they were financial or otherwise. Um, but I think it was a good discussion, and I think it was good in a different way. Those of us who have been on board for a while may have gone to the roundtables that they held in person, which ended up having, you know, people at different tables, and you were sitting with one legislator or legislator aide. And three board members from different districts, and maybe they reported out afterwards, but he didn't get to hear everybody and didn't get to um, have as much of a connection as we did in the Zoom meeting. So I thought it went well. It was a very collaborative conversation with, with a, a very good number of legislators who were on that call um, with us and, and other districts, and then individual um, Zoom calls with. Uh, they're specific with, with a legislator for their specific districts. Um, later on that following week uh, that Steve and I attended um, with Senator Harkum and Assemblywoman Levenberg um, to discuss uh, issues that I've seen um, with the upcoming budget. So I think there were productive conversations and it was good to hear from you know a, a level of, um, I think there was a, a real level of, uh, I guess, uh, People being on the same page uh, throughout uh, throughout the districts and the county in terms of what the, the real priorities were. And I think there was a real good understanding from our legislators of what those priorities were and and where they would be able to to maybe help move. You know. And and I would add one other thing, which is that a couple of the participants were newly elected legislators. Um, most of the folks who spoke, uh, who were present, were um, Democrats, some were Republicans, and those Republicans, I'm thinking in particular, two uh, state assembly persons who were newly elected were very much in tune with what we as board members or superintendents were, were asking, and were in tune with the needs of our um, communities. So there was not a divide right. between Democrat and Republican, as you might see elsewhere. I think everybody 
um, whether they were new new legislators or veteran legislators, whether Republican, Democrat, all saw the same needs and, and, and appreciated them, including some discussions, they had extensive discussions on things such as funding for special acts school districts and their financial needs. Uh, mm -hmm. We have talked about um, supporting students in the area of mental health and what kind of programs would be provided uh, and monies could, could be done. Uh, talked about uh, um, climate resilient schools and electric vehicles. So there's a lot of discussion, a lot of area um, that we talked about. And then, so we finished that, I think, at like 9.30. Um, that night and the next morning, we were there at what, 8.30 or 9 o'clock with the NISBA virtual capital conference, <laughs> which, is, which was basically presentations by um, NISBA and then thereafter by um, uh, Shelley Mayer and Assemblyman Benedetto, the Head of the Senate and Education and Assembly Education Committee, they're kind of talking about um, what they saw coming up in the legislature. And uh, following that, um, the governor's office uh, had two individuals who came to speak to us uh, virtually by Zoom. And one was the Assistant Secretary of the Governor for Education, the other one was the Assistant Counsel. And one of the things that he said, that one of them, I don't forget which one, said, you can have direct access to these folks in the governor's office. If there are things that you want to talk to about, or you want to bring to our attention. Now, knowing how the governor's office has acted as being you know, kind of behind the fortress of the second floor of the Capitol, the fact that they even were willing to say that if we have things, if you work through NISBA government, governmental relations office, we'd be glad to talk to you was a very refreshing change from what I've seen over past years and decades. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see, the uh, NISBA, that NISBA um, capital conference was recorded um, and I think the sessions were sent out to everybody on email. Um, so if you have some time, I would actually highly recommend checking out at least the one um, where the government relations team breaks down the budget um, and then that session with the governor's office. I think they were very uh, informative. And I would add one last thing that at the end, the Brian Fessler, who is the head of the government advocacy mm -hmm. the, um, group or department at NISBA, talked about tri advocacy tricks tips and tricks, kind of things that might be obvious, might not, but like, what do you do when you're going to see a legislator or a legislative aid? How do you prepare? What, what do you bring? What do you, should you send things ahead of time? What's your follow-up memo? What's the material you do? A lot of very practical guidance and practical advice for, for engaging in advocacy efforts and you know, in a way, we pass resolutions and we say that's great. But I think the fact that, you know, that, that ability to if, go see Pete Harkham or his chief of staff or Dana Levenberg or Mike Lawler, if, it, if you're doing something on the federal level and actually sitting down and talking with them for 15, 20 minutes or their aides may be more effective than just the resolutions that we I will go on because you told me to <laughs> on I the told you to go on and yeah, <laughs> on the following Monday, <laughs> right? The West Park had its monthly <laughs> legislative advocacy committee meeting, talked about different items mm -hmm. that are going to be coming up, um, and uh, talked about what they thought our priorities should be in what West Park will focus on. I'm not going to go into them in great detail. I have my notes here, and we can obviously talk about it as a committee as we move okay. forward. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, so for board development, uh, Anna and I met, and Anna, thank you, uh, 
managed our first of two information sessions for people who are interested in board service. Um, that was something we discussed. We also talked about um, looking into um, having a, a presentation um, probably in May uh, for the board about uh, board self-evaluation. Um, so working on some of that and uh, you know, just looking at some of the various end of the year things that, that we're developing. Stay with the data. Okay. Miss anything? No, I want to thank Josh and Eleanor for coming today. Um, we have former board member Andrea Fury there also. Um, thank you, Andrea, for coming to meet with any potential um, persons interested in running the board candidacy. Um, and then I'll turn it over to you for communication. So to piggyback on um, kind of what we discussed with board development, the thing that's kind of pressing right now with respect to communications is getting out what's required as a board information about the board elections. And then immediately after that, the budget, which in previous meetings we've discussed uh, with Denise and um, that timeline is set. So it, it, I mean, I don't see the need to meet any time in the near future, but uh, certainly we will before the next board election. If I could just continue for just one second. Um, I want to say that it's with deep regret that I have to say that I'm not going to be um, the Student Faculty Congress representative anymore. Um, Josh Diamond has very graciously uh, agreed to resume his prior seat um, on that committee. Uh, it was truly one of the most um, fulfilling things that I've done as a board member. I would encourage my future board members when you're considering your committees or your service to, to really look into that, to see our students, three of whom are here tonight, um, just to think and discuss and to see the faculty interact with them in a way that really um, reflects the visions and the things that we talk about in this term is really empowering. So I'm very sad about that, but they have commitments that don't allow me to continue to serve as the representative to the faculty congress. But I am so proud of all of you for the work that you do and continue to do good work, please, for all of us. We need that. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, policy. Well, policy. 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 Well, except I will say policy met <laughs> on the 15th. We continued our discussion on um, equity and inclusivity policies um, here led that discussion. It was a very um, um, extensive and informative discussion with a lot of input from the board members and administration. And we will be working on looking more specifically at policy language. And uh, it is our intention uh, to, once we have come up with a draft to um, solicit comments, questions, etc., from various groups within the community, including building planning councils, um, administrative council, student faculty congress, and um, other groups that uh, will help, help inform us before we are actually going to be bringing something to the board for mm -hmm. our first reading and consideration at that stage. So. <clears throat> I just wanted everybody to know that it's a it's a process that has, you know, taken a while, but it's also a process that we feel as a committee requires broad discussion before anything will be um, mm -hmm. brought to the, the full board level. So we have the best possible product as well as we can. Okay. All right. Now move on. Do you have any good product? No. Uh, we will now move on to polling the board. So I'll open up to anyone who has anything for polling. Josh. I attended the uh, CET Building Planning Council today. Mm -hmm. uh, we uh, spent some time talking about two items. Uh, we mostly were focused on some of the uh, the issues we uh, discussion concerning uh, the uh, I forget the term the the new version of the strategic co coherence plan, and as as we move forward with our uh, with the uh, ongoing evolution of learning, and uh, so essentially talking about ways that 
teachers are collaborating across classrooms and um, and as part of the uh, the house program. There's a discussion of a recent uh, full building assembly, which is something that has not been happening quite as often as it had been, uh, and uh, the advantages of that, uh, we're doing that occasionally, as opposed to just the house uh, assemblies. Um, and that was uh, was very interesting. And there was a, a good discussion of the, the balance between full school assemblies versus uh, assemblies that are smaller and how that could be worked into the schedule um, and uh, which was uh, very interesting. GVC, Building Planning Council up today. <clears throat> we uh, um, actually had a really interesting night last night, uh, the, the night school. It was uh, four faculty members passion projects. I attended game theory. Uh, 15 parents showed up. It was a phenomenal event. It was a really great opportunity to get to see firsthand how risk taking can have a, a tremendous impact on, on learning. And, and uh, I was telling members of the, of the building planning council that I left the room feeling my brain firing mm -hmm. new, new, you know, new pathways. Uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience and I highly recommend the next time this, this uh, is held. I encourage anybody in the community to attend. Uh, it was a very, very interesting event. Um, just some dates and some things to keep an eye out for. Fourth grade parent orientation is going to happen in May, so keep an announcement on that about the specific date. Um, Friday, May 12th is the Friday Night Stripes. The PBC PTA will be putting out a call for volunteers, specific for fourth graders, or fourth grade parents. And one of the things that PBC uh, the planning council talked about was trying to shed more light on the hidden um, transitions mm -hmm. right, the, the, in, in within the middle school. And so um, PBC will be holding a sixth grade transition session sometime in May. And I already talked about the book. Yeah. Is that for parents or for kids? For parents. The sixth grade. Yes. yes. So then that's transitioning from, from six to seven. From six to yeah. when you're going into an actual class, uh, subject by subject and correct, right. and correct, because it's moving slightly different. Kids, like every right. year, kids there's a little bit from, more uh, right. uh, responsibility I pass on to students. Uh, so just to inform the parents about that process. Yeah. And that's modified sports. Seventh grade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah. Right. Um, I can we'll pick quickly pick back on. I also attended uh, the. Uh, night school last night um and it was just an incredible event um and i think what was so what was most exciting to me except for aside from learning about game theory with omar um was seeing how excited our teachers yes. were to share their passion pursuits and share the things that they really like to take a deep dive in with with parents like there was just such um, excitement, enthusiasm, and engagement in those rooms. Uh, it was it was really a tremendous event, and I look forward to the, the next time we hold one. Uh, so I would encourage lots of people to to join the next time that they put one on. So uh, yeah, anybody else for Kevin? Yeah, the um, high school building plan council met this afternoon, which I attended, and the you know, continued discussion on uh, the general subject of artificial intelligence chat, GPT, GPT, and its use within uh, the school, its use by students. And the plan is that uh, you start with a Kind of getting the sense of what's how students use and how students perceive um, you know, chat GPT and other artificial intelligence um, programs uh, and have how that might fit into the way they think about um, learning and how therefore it might be used uh, by teachers in uh, their teaching. Um, it's the expectation to start probably with a student survey to be done through a, um, a Google 
monkey or survey monkey kind of survey. With a um, I know what you meant, Neil. Yeah, <laughs> fine. That's fine. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> With um, kind of not so much you know the yes no questions or the check the box questions, but more qualitative information, which then you know sort of like a thought exchange in a sense, but not using a thought exchange vehicle, followed up by a uh, chat having um, a session sometime in the next few weeks, uh, devoted to having discussions in each chat about what do you think? How do you use it? Do you, you know, <clears throat> misuse it? Do you, you know, not that anybody will admit that publicly, you know, they might, you know, admit it in, um, you know, in a an anonymous survey. Why not in yours? <laughs> <laughs> and, and then after that, to see how it can enhance teaching and enhance um, student engagement. Um, and, you know, we, we only had a small group. We didn't have the full complement there. But I think between um, the discussions the faculty have had, and as was reported to us, and you know, informal discussions among faculty discussions that among students that have been described, uh, we've we've decided this is an area that uh, you know, really we can learn a lot and perhaps also provide some information and make a context, I can call it, to parents who, um, you know, and, and maybe even get, get their feelings and what do they think about it, whether that can, that can help inform high school and presumably this is the kind of work that we go across school. So that's what we talked about. Thank you. Anyone else before? All right, that brings us to items needed for the next Board of Education meeting. So our next meeting is our March 23rd work session, which as Denise mentioned, will be um, the 2023-2024 budget overview. Um, we will include, as slightly uh, different from most work sessions, we will include a um, public comment period um, during that meeting as well, since that will be an overview of the entire budget. Um, and since we, we traditionally, during Budget Saturdays, would always have make sure that we had provided comment periods for the community. So that is it for that. If anyone has any questions on the next meeting. Otherwise, we recommend an action that the Board of Education adjourns the meeting at 2019 p.m. 1019 p.m. Yeah. This is getting late. Uh, uh, Omar, can I get a second? We don't want to leave. Yes, I don't think so. Nobody's second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Motion carried. Thank you all very much. Have a lovely evening.